the oldest maker, uh, Mr. Chan, he passed away yesterday. He is uh, part of the Singapore Origami Group. He was 79. And uh, we would see him. We have been, he's been part of the Maker Fair ever since day one. So uh, before we start today's events, um, can I just request everyone to just take a moment to, let's have a minute of silence for just for him. A very good morning, makers, speakers, VIPs, and guests. Welcome to the inaugural Singapore Maker Summit, launching four days of maker goodness right here at the Science Centre of Singapore. You can share your thoughts about the Maker Summit and upcoming maker extravaganza on social media with the hashtag SGMakerFact. Okay, my name is Fatin, and I'll be your MC for this morning. We hope that you have enjoyed the video that was flashed earlier. It shows a snippet of what is waiting for you this weekend at Maker Fair. For the past six years, makeup movement in Singapore has grown by leaps and bounds, and the number of stakeholders has dramatically increased. The impact of this makeup movement is felt in several areas, including education, family bonding, entrepreneurship, community, and international relations. Today, it is time for us to look back and reflect on the enormous progress that has been made in the maker movement. We have with us today a number of influencers of the maker movement and the people who are working tirelessly in their domains to grow the movement. Let us hear from them. We will invite each speaker on stage for a short introduction of their work and then we will look forward to a lively panel discussion after. So let us put our hands together to welcome Mr. Dale Dorothy, founder of Make Media, who will be speaking on Mission for Makers. Hi hey everybody. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, good to be here. Let's see if we can connect up here without too much of a problem. here a couple of years ago, two years ago, for, for uh, Maker Faire uh, Singapore in 2015, I guess it was. And uh, uh, I had such a good time, enjoyed seeing so, so many good people. And I just want to acknowledge Kirithika and her tireless efforts to organize here. In <laughs> uh, the reason the movement is growing is because of people like Kirithika. You know, and, and uh, they are working at the community level and they're doing lots of things to bring people together. And uh, that in itself is a mission that uh, I, I'd love to invite more of you to join and participate in because um, we talk a lot about people who make things, but there are people here who are making the movement and that is important and, and it happens because of the things that each of us can do at a family level, a neighborhood level, a community level, and even at a cultural level. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my story, but some, some of you probably uh, might know this. This is a current issue of the magazine I published called Make. Um, it's in its 13th year. And uh, you know, given the way publishing goes and things like that, it's, it's uh, sort of remarkable that this even niche exists and that people uh, are interested in, in it. Um, make as a magazine is in many ways like an old popular science or popular mechanics magazine, if you know those from like the 50s. But I, what I wanted to do is sort of infuse it with digital technology and new things that were happening that uh, uh, um, talked a little bit about what people were doing. And so um, 
you know, but this particular issue is our community issue, and it talks about how groups of people are building projects together. A lot of our work is DIY, do-it-yourself projects, but this is really featuring larger kids. This is Megabot on the cover, which is a, a large combat robot that is going to fight another robot in Japan, I believe, in, in the end of August. Um, but at the heart of what I, I think I, I discovered in creating the magazine and gave it a name was this idea of maker. Um, in, in some ways, it was it was open to be used. It, 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 it is a general term, which I like. And people say, how do you define maker? And I said, well, you define it. You know, it, Define it so that you're a maker. Um, if you like to cook, you're a maker. right? If you like to um, uh, work on cars and you're a mechanic, you're a maker. If you like to work with Arduino and if you like to work with robots, you're a maker. And so to some degree, that inclusive sense of this is um, possible for, for many of us to do. And, and uh, um, you know, soon after that, I began bringing, uh, started our first Maker Fair 12 years ago in, in San Francisco Bay Area. And initially, my idea was I, I just enjoyed meeting makers, and I thought other people would. When you got to see their projects uh, and what you um, got to talk to them about, it's something we didn't have a place for in our culture. Uh, we don't get it through media on TV. We don't often get it at other places. Um, so I was really interested in how show and tell was a method for us to share what we do kind of in private and bring it out in the public so other people could see it. And what happens is people make connections. People begin to see that um, uh, many people have the same interests. Well, we've grown Maker Fair. Last year, uh, we had 191 Maker Fairs in 40 countries. And uh, this year, it'll probably be about 225 or something like that. And again, it's because of the, the fact that people want to organize a fair and, and organize their local community is the reason it exists. Um, uh, the events are family-oriented. They're open to participation for uh, lots of people. And you know the delight in the Maker Faire is you really never know what's going to come in and what you're going to see. Um, and, and I still enjoy it for that purpose, that it's surprising and delightful to go to a Maker Faire and see what people are working on. Uh, it is more an exhibition than a competition. There are no categories for prizes. There are no uh, incentives for people in, in some ways other than to bring what they, they share. Uh, on this trip that I'm on, uh, I was last weekend in, in Xi'an, in China, and, uh, and just seeing, you know, it's, uh, for me it's really fun to see the messaging and the imagery, you know, really come uh, back, as, uh, as you're pointing out, the terracotta warriors are, and the making robots have, have been combined here in a beautiful way. And um, to see this uh, jump into new languages and cultures, and here's an example. So in China, the word that they're using for maker is tronkor, and it tends to be associated with innovator, right? And because the premier of China said, we want more tronkors, and, and this has kind of gotten everybody to sort of say, well, we need maker education, and we need lots of things here. But even in the maker community there, they're, they're a little bit worried that, well, it, it isn't just about creating innovators. I, and when I started with this, I thought what was really powerful about the maker idea was that it's, it's located inside of you. It's something in your heart, it's something in your mind that you enjoy and, and are satisfied by. And that causes you to do many things, to grow and develop. And, and so uh, they've been trying to kind of get that message out in China in ways of this sort of live to make is a, in a, a, a way of saying, hey, this is something I do because I love to do it, not because I'm just going to create a business. Now, I'm not denigrating creating businesses out of this. I, I like that idea. But my experience is that 10 to 20% 10 to of makers do that. So why are the other 80, what are the other 80% there for? <laughs> They're there because they love doing this, right? It's something they do to learn and explore and, and engage with the world around them. And what I you know, really thought that the goal of, of, of this movement uh, and, and Maker Faire 
uh, particular was to s just to get people to have this experience of making and to see themselves as makers, not just consumers. You know, we are increasingly defined by our culture uh, in terms of what we buy, not what we do, not what we create, not what we make. And I wanted to shift that. And sometimes it feels like a lonely battle, like we're not winning, <laughs> you know, because culture is so powerful, consumer culture is so powerful, so controlling. But I do feel we're making some progress, and um, and I, I I can only hope that people recognize this capacity in them, this human capacity to make things. Our second shift is done. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone. Good to have you. Ready? But. Uh, the other kind of almost philosophical point, you know, is that I know, you know, we, we probably uh, are among the group that thinks of ourselves as makers. We identify with that. And, and from the beginning, they're the people that read my magazine and, and participate in maker fairs. And we can say, fine, that's, this room isn't full, but that's okay. But darn it, I want it to be full. I want everybody here. And, and I believe that the goal, again, of Maker Fairs is to reach out and touch more people and invite them to, to, to come in and participate as makers. That it's something human, it's something in all of us. But just like sports, just like music, if you don't have access to, to either facilities or coaching or even someone asking you, inviting you to participate, you may never find out whether you're a musician or an athlete or a maker. I think what brings this community or holds this community together is that we share a number of things in common. Um, certainly, we're increasingly sharing a tool set. You know, small a little electronics that are really cheap are becoming creative tools for lots of applications that um, are generated by the community. So we, tools like Arduino, or 3D printers, or laser cutters, that's, that's ostensibly the tool set. But we're also creating those tools, and that's exciting too. It's also a skill set. You have to learn how to do these things, and you can get better at doing them. I think the real difference here and is, is a lot of this in the past is we thought people needed a certain aptitude to have this skill set, that they somewhat genetically or something you know, made them good at this. But I believe it's for everybody. And it, it is just a matter of, of, of trying. And maybe failing, but trying again. And where I see people pushing the edge in the maker movement is not because they take, you know, a group of people and say, okay, that 10% of people, they're really technically gifted and they could do making. It's when they say that whole group can do making. And we have ways to, to uh, show them. The, the, the last thing that I think is awfully important is this idea of mindset that um, you know, I've, I've written about and, and talked about a lot. It, it is uh, um, a way of looking at the world, a way of engaging with the world. It is the kind of thing that, that um, certainly involves what we call agency or a sense of autonomy that I can do things. And I'm not just going to, like in a consumer sense, complain about problems. I'm going to try to solve them. I'm going to own that. And, and again, a mindset is also about things like creativity and risk tolerance. You know, I think one of the hardest things in life is to believe in an idea especially when it's your idea. And that takes courage. That takes confidence. And it takes practice. So what Marshall McLuhan said, we shape our tools and our tools shape us. And I think this is what's so exciting about the maker movement is that as things like 3D printers, from when I started the magazine, we weren't talking about 3D printers. But makers went out and created 3D printers like MakerBot and then Ultimaker and others. So we create these tools. 
And then generations, we watch, watch kids walk up to a 3D printer, and they're thinking differently about what they can do. Right? It shapes how we think about what's possible. And then um, even to some degree, when we don't have the tools, we can build them. And that is really incredibly powerful. So when we think about making, um, I like that I, I mentioned sports and music. Right? We don't just discover that we're gifted in sports or music. We have to practice it. We have to demonstrate it. We have to learn it over time. And I think this is really the key insight for thinking about this in education, but even in a lifelong learning sense, and why things like hobbies and such make sense here, is that a practice is, is literally doing something over and over, and ideally getting better as a result. But I like to think of things, I was just in China, thinking about like Tai Chi as a practice. We have cultural traditions that span you know, thousands of years that are based on practices. But when we look at innovation and creativity, our culture is kind of weak in saying, what, the, what is that practice look like? What does it mean to develop that practice at a young age and engage in, and, and grow in, in uh, sophistication over time? The, the, the last, uh, or not last, but the, the other thing about making that I, I think is worth emphasizing, and certainly something I kind of saw inherently in the magazine, when, but I was aiming it a little bit more for adults than kids, was play. That making is rooted, grounded, located, originated in play. And, and when we're in a, a, mind, a playful mindset, you know, we like to take risks. We like to explore. We don't care if we fail a whole lot. We can, it's just play. And I think play has these qualities like immersion, where we're so into something. We have great focus, great concentration, and we see things we would not see if we were just standing distantly looking at something. But because makers, when they get into 3D printing, you know, spend so much time in 3D printing, they really know what they're doing there. And it comes from play. And, and later on, I think they begin to have goals. But I think, again, education wants them to have goals in the beginning. I just want them to play. I want them to enjoy themselves, have fun. Because if they have fun, they'll keep doing it. You know, when we make it serious and say, well, here's the goal of this exercise, and you have to accomplish that, you know, you shift it to, to work, and you take the joy out of it. And ideally, even as adults, this sense of play is something we carry into work. And it's, it's, it's what allows us to be creative and exploring and, and curious. So making is a way of learning by doing, of doing design, of doing research, and, and I think particularly creative problem solving. And I, 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 I think we can all participate in this. This is not necessarily about developing high levels of expertise. It's actually developing the practice. Again, think about music. How many superstar musicians are there? Very few. But how many people do you know that play an instrument? Sometimes for their own enjoyment. Just they define what that means. And they challenge themselves and they grow. This is, again, something located in humans. But I think we can look at it and say it, it does produce innovations and innovators. It is uh, uh, this practice, this sense of play, um, uh, create the conditions out of which innovation is possible. And it, it helps to shape a community and practice to which we all belong, and we belong it locally, we belong to it globally, that we can share ideas about how to do something in, in one country and another, with one Arduino and another. So, um, and I think the, the last thing, as a, both sort of a, a movement and an ecosystem and a market, it's self-organized. There isn't one big player that's, you know, a Google trying to put it all together. It's a lot of people doing work independently and, and you can act. You can call yourself a maker. You don't have to ask someone's permission to do that. You can organize a workshop. You don't need to be at a university to do that. You can start a business and you don't have to be at a large company to do that. And finally, uh, I believe makers have inside of themselves, sometimes they don't even realize that a sense of purpose, a, a direction, a, a goals that emerge from what they enjoy doing and what they 
want to create in the world. Let me give you an example. One of my favorite ones, Logan. This is David McMillan. David uh, lived at the time in the Bay Area in, in California. And he had an idea about building a boat. He called it the Sea Charger. It was going to be a solar powered boat. It was going to be an autonomous boat, which means it would have no human being on it. It would not have a human pilot. It would use software and hardware to con navigate it, uh, a, a trip in the ocean. So you can see in its earliest inception, you know, a chalkboard where he's writing a design and you can see the keel and you can see a list of sort of major components like Arjupyre and, he, you know, which kind of comes from the drone world. And he's trying to figure out, you know, he needs batteries, he needs enclosures and, and, and you know, obviously so. Here's, you know, a prototype. Here's what it looks like off the board. You know, uh, 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 Eight-foot boat. Is it, I mean, that looks larger on the screen maybe than it actually is. It's kind of small. So eight feet uh, of mostly solar panels. David said, I built the sea charger in my garage not for money or competition, but simply as a challenge, a personal challenge. He wanted to see if he could make his idea real and it would work. He didn't need anybody to offer him a, a reward for doing so. Um, he just wanted to figure out how to do this. And of course, he worked on it over time and used various tools to model it, but this is kind of what makes him a maker in many ways. He said what started as a year-long project turned into 30 months of mistakes, compromises, and do-overs. Now, was it perfect? No. He had to keep doing it and doing it over, and he got closer each time. He found people to help him. He tried different components, and, and he got it going. Well, he brought it to Maker Fair in 2016 and, and had an exhibit and put it out there. And he said he talked to people, and some people like engineers and come and says, this will never work. You know, electronics are going to get all back. You know, that boat's going to fail. And he goes, thank you very much. You know, I think it will work. But the only way you actually find out about that is not arguing at a Maker Fair about it, is you go to the ocean and you put the darn boat in the water. <laughs> so, but he went to, a week after Maker Fair, he went to Half Moon Bay in California and he set his sea charger in the water and he programmed it to go to Hawaii. This eight foot boat across the Pacific Ocean to Hawaii with no pilot, no collision detection either. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, he had inside of it an ability to communicate with a satellite, like a, modem, a satellite modem. So it sent a signal every two hours and says, here's where I am. And when he first launched it, he noticed the winds were taking it south, but it was trying to correct. But for a couple days, it was going off course because of, of winds. And then a couple days, weeks later, he lost contact with the boat. He said, oh my. This is, you know, one day went by and he didn't hear from it. Two days went by and he didn't hear from it. And the third day came by and it came back. You know, just, you know how technology is. That explains me sometimes it works. And, uh, and he was happy and he followed it. Well. 41 days after launch, Damon and his family went to Hawaii and saw his boat come into the shore. Right? Isn't that a great ending for like a project that starts in a garage, starts in your head, and you build it? And that boat made it all the way across the Pacific Ocean, and and you know he and his his family, you know, here are, are bringing it out of the water, and and uh, the, the sea charger. You know, completed its mission, right? Well, it, it doesn't end here because Damon's a maker and he's kind of cheap. So he figures out that if he takes the Sea Charger boat and puts it in a crate to send it back to California, it's going to cost them some money. <laughs> <laughs> so he puts the Sea Charger back in the water <laughs> and programs it for New Zealand, <laughs> taking it way beyond its original design. And uh, now, it actually made uh, progress going 6,480 miles more, and, but failed 400 miles short of New Zealand. It, it lost communication, the rudder broke. But, and, and it certainly accomplished that. Now, there's a, we published the story in May last January, uh, had him write about it, and uh, when we learned more about the details. And, he, uh, Damon said, I have to tell you, 
Um, I have a mother who's particularly proud of what I do and, and wouldn't let go. She started contacting um, shipping lines that go between New Zealand and Hawaii, <laughs> asking them to look out for my boat. <laughs> now, you know, airlines have crashed in those areas and we haven't found a, a, a thing of them, about them. But a container ship from going to New Zealand found his boat and picked it up and it's now in the New Zealand Maritime Museum. <laughs> um, so, you know, this sort of gets to me at this essence of making. It's an adventure. It, it opens doors to us and possibilities we would never dream of if we didn't undertake with that simple idea to build something. Not just design it, but to actually build it and try it and get it, get it, get it in the world. Get it. Uh, to be real. So, I want to see more people like Damon in the world. I want to see more people like you in the world. And, and so, I, I think we have to really think about how our education systems, and, and, and I really think, you know, the secret behind this is we're, we're not just thinking about schools, we're thinking about learning communities. We're thinking about, like, Singapore as a, as, as, what are all the learning assets it has? What are all the community uh, people that are, are engaged in the learning communities here? What can you learn? How can you learn? It isn't all about formal learning, just as you come to the Science Center, and that's often called informal learning. So it's how do all these things work together? Because that's what the magic is. It isn't from just making curriculum here. It is from figuring out how culturally we value and support and celebrate all of this. So making is, is hands-on, it's interdisciplinary, it's not a subject. Making is not a subject for school. It's actually a way to integrate subjects and connect them. It's open and collaborative, not closed and competitive. It's experiential. I don't think making is about how much information you memorize. It's about the kind of experience you have doing something and learning from that. It's process oriented rather than just you know, knowing something. Think about how you learn to ride a bike. All the web pages in the world do not help you actually sit on a bike and learn how to balance that and pedal at the same time. Right? You have to do it over, you have to fall. Same thing with every other kind of vehicle we, we try to master. So there's something really true about this that we have to actually transform education to follow how people learn, right? Not just what they learn, but how, and how to engage kids in doing that. And lastly, sort of, you know, I, I think one of the ways to look at making in education and Maker Fair and everything else is what our work product is projects. It's doing projects. Now, there are different kinds of projects. Sometimes I could give you a project telling you to do this. The best kind are open-ended projects where you, like David, come up with the idea and start to work on it. And I think the kind of projects we want to make are fair are these original projects where people have come up with their own idea and developed that over time. But it is a project that I think the students do, they own in the sense it's theirs, and that's what they begin to share. So the key thing I, I believe for, for our communities to understand that sharing is what makes the maker community. Sharing these projects, sharing our knowledge, sharing our process. Not just doing it, but sharing it. And that's why Maker Fair is important. That's why school Maker Fairs and other things can be important. It, it, don't just sort of do something and then say, I'm done. You know, it's, it's, it's also telling a story about what you do and how you did it. So sometimes you can use that story to connect to other people who have similar interests, but, but you also get really <coughs> valuable feedback. And I think that ultimately is why we share, is we want feedback from other people, which even it could be positive, it could be like Damon got feedback from those engineers saying his boat wouldn't work. What does that do? It just makes you want to work harder and say, darn it, that boat would work. So feedback, it's generated by sharing. Um, I want to just sit, tell you a, brief, a, a new platform we've launched and, and uh, with Intel here um, called MakerShare. And this sort of 
is driven by a need that I've recognized for a long time. We have, you know, a couple hundred maker fairs around the world. And unless you went to the fair, did you know what those projects were and who the makers were? You don't, right? We collect, each fair collects that information, but after maker fair, it's kind of gone. And so I wanted to sort of create a platform where makers uh, and their projects can be shared um, by creating portfolios for those makers. And that they can add the projects not just at Maker Fair, but the projects they do at school, the projects they do at Maker Spaces. And so, you know, our goal here is to create, help you create your Maker portfolio. Um, we've also added in here ways to um, participate in a mission, and I'll go through that in a minute. As well as we want to, we want it to be a learning platform so you can learn to do these things. And um, so here's, you know, a screenshot from from uh, MakerShare, and I'll talk about Hannah in a moment here. But, you know, uh, people have been doing projects, and really, I have to say from education, well, and, and makerspaces are in the same category. I want to see what the students or the people, makers, are doing. You know, what are you creating? If you're going to build a makerspace in school, I think one of the best ways to measure its value is to see what projects come out of that, that program. What did the students do? It's, it's sort of like if you were training for sports and you never played a game. Or you, you had music training, but you never did a concert. Well, Maker Share is, is sort of part of that performance side of saying, here's what I did, and, and I want to tell you about it. So here's, here's some of the projects. But you know, <coughs> these are the kind of things I want to make note of. This is a young woman, a high school student. She's about 15 years old. Uh, Hannah Edge, and she lives in California. She came up to me after one of her talks and she said, I created a 3D printed spirometer. Who knows what a spirometer is? You did good. Um, I did, so I had to ask her, well, what the heck is it? You know, and she started telling me how it works and all this. But no, I said, well, what is it? Why? And she said, well, it measures your lung capacity, your intake and outtake. Right? And, and, and she explained, you know, how she was going to, how she designed this. And she had a graphic artist background, wasn't technical, but kind of just started to figure this all out. I said, Hannah, why did you want to build a spirometer? And she said, I have asthma. And I go to the doctors and they measure my breathing using a spirometer. It's a big, expensive device. But I don't have asthma attacks when I'm in the doctor's office. I have them when I'm visiting my horse or out playing on the on the ball field or, or doing things out, in the, out, out and around. And I wanted to be able to measure that. So she created this and, um, and she it, it actually connects to her cell phone. So when she um, uh, you know, breathes into it, the, the readings come out on her cell phone. And you know, she created this for a couple hundred, uh, you know, well, I don't know what the, the process cost her, but you know, the, this is about 10 times cheaper than the, the, the doctor's spirometer that she uses there. And it's something that she can carry around. And she believes, probably rightly so, that other people need that. So she's put that up on Maker Share. She came to Maker Fair in the Bay Area this year. And she's, you know, it's really an example of, you know, I care about the spirometer, but I care even more about Hannah. And this shows what she can do. And this is what I really want us to see in the maker community, not just, oh, that's a cool project, but there's a person behind that project, and let's look at what they can do and what they might be able to do in the future. Um, MIT, a, a, you know, large, um, probably the top university, a technical university in, in, in the U.S., uh, you know, is allowing students to submit maker portfolios. So you would, in the future, be able to take the portfolio you create a maker share and give them a link to it. Right? Um, they have a, you know, but they've been doing that for a couple of years. And I think it's a trend in STEM. If you, if you go to design school, if you apply to a design school, they want to see a portfolio of your work. But if you go to engineering school, they say, look, you, let me see your test scores. But I think engineering as a profession needs to change to look at greater diversity in the kinds of thinkers and people it's admitting. So if I'm creative and I don't have great math scores, I'm going to go to design school. If I'm not creative, and I have great math scares, I'm going to engineering. It's not a good world. Like, we should have both creative, you know, in fact, engineering wants to be more design friendly and, and, and aware. 
But, um, and, and lastly, on those missions, the, the, the idea also is to define missions that are important to our community. Um, the Science Center could define missions. Um, individuals um, could define missions. And uh, um, there was an example that we have up on the site. Um, Malia, she, uh, Rhoda, she lives about a, a, a mile from where we do Maker Faire in the Bay Area. And her mom kind of says, you know, would it be useful for me to come to Maker Faire? I'm looking for something for my daughter, Malia. She has 11 years old, she has cerebral palsy. And I can understand her, but I've been around her a lot. But when, when she talks, and she has a lot to say, people have trouble understanding her. Could we to build a, a device, she called an articulator, that took her sounds and, and helped express them in human language a little bit more clearly for other people. And, um, and I don't know if it can be done exactly, but it does show you that you know, we can solve for the problem of one person, whether there's a product there or not. We can help people in unique ways. And I think in schools, what if we, we have enough of those problems that, that students are inspired to go solve real problems for real people? That's what I mean by missions here. So, I just in closing, I, I think making changes us. It's something happening to us as well as to the physical world. It isn't just, I'm smart, you know, where I get smarter. But it actually, I think, changes our, our, our orientation to the world. It makes us active participants, creators, and makers, and shapers of that world. It makes us uh, members of a community that we can use, um, tap into, collaborate with, um, learn from, teach you know, um, in this community. And there are all kinds of makers. And each one of them has a story. And each one is growing and developing in new ways. Lastly, I just give a shout out to my book, Free to Make, that I published last year. Um, has more kind of the philosophy behind this, a lot on the maker mindset. Um, I encourage you. Um, I sometimes, <laughs> I've gone on too long here, but um, I, I, there's so much I want to share with people, really, about what's behind the maker movement and what, you know, the connections historically, the connections to our future. Um, you know, like going to China. You know, as I said earlier, they know the word maker and they want it, but they don't know what it is. Right? They don't know what they want. And, and I think they haven't lived it yet. They haven't figured that out. And so us who are makers need to help people understand what it means to be a maker. So I, I encourage you to check that out. And I, and I conclude by say my, my mission has been to empower makers and so that they can explore and create and innovate and all the things that come from that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dale, for the insightful talk on the joy of making and spreading the love of making, making life an adventure. Our next speaker is our own Associate Professor Lim Tit Ming, Chief Executive of Science Centre Singapore, who will speak on the topic, A Powerful Endorsement, You Made. Well, uh, I should change the title, uh, <laughs> but I forgot what title I put in. <laughs> but in a way, it is about how we come together and make it uh, happen for this little I, I will. Uh, I will try to keep to my time. Uh, you know, Sorry. <laughs> you, you deserve all the time because uh, there's so much to learn from you. Uh, so when I when I designed this talk, I was I, I thought of a song, a song that I like very much. It's an English song, which is rare because I came from Chinese school. It's called the Twelve of Never. The, the lyrics is about you ask how much I need you, must I explain? You ask how much I love you, how should I explain? So there are twelve. Never, right? So I'm going to give you 12 reasons of why Science Center Singapore uh, is really championing the uh, maker movement in big ways. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, good. Right. Um, many of the things I'm going to say uh, echo a lot of what uh, you have shared. And uh, this is my firm hypothesis that all of us are born to be scientists and engineers because we are born with this in thing and the in things uh, is about it. The in nature to inquire to innovate. And uh, 
I think we should go back to this. Uh, playing is natural, and through playing, we make things. And as a child, we learn through playing, we learn through really putting our in thing into expressive actions. And so I'm a firm believer of let's make it and bring back the childlike nature in us and also preserve a childlike in thing, which is so important for the kind of uh, future uh, innovations, uh, creativity, and so on and so forth, uh, and not conforming them into passing the grades, uh, exams, and, and so on and so forth, fixing the syllabus. So reason number two is uh, it's very empowering. I think uh, Dale showed us very good examples of empowerment. And indeed, uh, making can change life, and uh, making allow us to come up with solutions, improvement, and so on. Uh, this speaks for itself. Okay, you can make a better sanitary system, you improve not just own family life, you can change the community, you can change society. Uh, the next reason is uh, how making is really changing or, or really impactful in the way we learn. I mean, I came from a Chinese school, and since young, our teachers told us that when you learn, you must engage your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your heart, which is your mind, and your hands. It's called Du Su Yogu Ta. So you must have all this, in, then you will do well in your studies. And I firmly believe in this. And I think in Singapore, uh, uh, we have been chasing after the grades for far too long, and some parents realize it. So some parents realize that the, the challenge in, in the bring, bringing up children and preserving their in thing uh, so that they continue to be curious and innovative. So there is this movement made by parents for parents. It's about coming up with things to engage kids to learn the way they naturally do using the in things that I mentioned earlier. Reason number four is uh, it's about, again, not just learning two-dimensional knowledge, but making real the knowledge apply in real-world situation, make it relevant. And this, seeing that what you learn is making a change and, and is, is, uh, is, is a very good motivation, it will drive positive learning behavior. And because of that, we set up a STEM Inc., STEM Applied Learning uh, Program. Uh, it was a very good uh, opportunity for us when the then Minister of Education, Mr. Heng, uh, asked us to do something about it. And we saw that school kids really are driven, and this program that is going to mainstream has no examinations. And what they do is they do open-ended projects, and some projects uh, enable them to go and tell the world, and uh, they won award, and they're mentioned in the newspapers. And these students came from humble background, or, or not elite school, I call them, uh, and they never dreamt of themselves being featured as innovators and uh, creators of solutions. Reason number five is uh, community engagement. Uh, Dale spoke personally about how the community make uh, makers movement possible. And indeed, if you look at uh, the growth of Singapore maker movement, we started as mini maker fair. I see among us somebody still uh, putting on that mini maker fair uh, t-shirt, uh, nostalgic. And uh, we grew from strength to strength. And the power to make is indeed very much appreciated by all, young and old. And uh, in 2015, when Dale was here as our special speaker in, in our Maker Fair, uh, in the audience was the then Minister for Education, Mr. Heng. And Dale put a picture up about how makers were introduced to the White House to meet President Obama. And then Minister turned to me and said, I want to see makers coming to Istana. And we went to Istana twice. So this was uh, the recent one. And, and indeed, we drew a huge crowd. And uh, reason number six, I'm halfway through, uh, making cherish joy, satisfaction. I think this again, uh, uh, resonating what we heard earlier, and there are many, many interesting stories. And uh, there's this one, uh, this lady tried to solve a problem that the father had. He had leukemia and he had to take a lot of uh, medicine and he's allergic to so many things. So she came up with, can I create a clothes, uh, materials that will not be rejected by that? Father, and then she discovered how to use sour milk to make soup. And uh, you know, a lot of uh, milk are actually they turn sour because you don't consume them, they throw it away, and now she created a new life for sour milk. 
And uh, people are about uh, uh, pollution, right? I mean, uh, and this is a very interesting solution. You can actually take the pollutants and create ink and engage so many communities to, to derive joy. Okay, uh, 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 you, you turn many pollutants into beautiful art forms and materials. Uh, reason number seven is uh, yeah, it's about self-esteem and, and create self-worth. Uh, I think this is very important because uh, sometimes you are judged by how good you perform in school, whether you score A's or not, uh, whether you are scholars or farmers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but when you make, you, you empower yourself, you create self-worth. And to, to me, this guy really not only creates self-worth uh, and all that self-esteem, he is looking at man flying, and, and imagine his suit uh, can create many, many potential. So this is, again, another very interesting example of uh, making uh, and powering. And this is about uh, lifelong learning. And I had this picture because my, my sister, who was a retired teacher, went to a workshop uh, in, in a community center near us. And it's part of the Passion Art uh, Festival. We are partnering the People's Association to engage the whole of Singapore to create art pieces using arts and science and technology. And this uh, old couple were there and they were so happy making this. And what I put here is you know, a lot of Chinese uh, think that when you're old, the Chinese say, when you're old, ah, you're useless. Okay, you end up becoming a, 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 a rice bucket, you only eat rice, and, and that's it. Fun Pong is a useless, useless. And then they say, oh, when I grow old, I became uh, clumsy, I'm no more agile. But we are transforming that. And, uh, and Science Centre is really reaching out to the, uh, the silver hair and you will see a lot of engagement because we believe in lifelong learning. That's why we also partnering the uh, lifelong learning institutions and institutions. And it's also empowering for people who are physically limited. Uh, and this is one of the very good example that you can create solutions even a wheelchair-bound person can drive a car and be very mobile. Uh, reason number nine is ageless. Really, you saw the example of, uh, of the, the, the old, old couples learning new things and making things that they're so happy with. And this is really ageless and, and people can make things to, to impact society and household and community and so on and so forth. I think you, you are very familiar with this, uh, using uh, plastic bottles to create air conditions for the house even without electricity. And uh, making dirty water drinkable, like these are really impactful and, and cut across social strata society and so on. Number 10 is part of the knowledge-based <coughs> economy. And I think the, the power of STEM indeed allows us to create all kinds of solutions. And uh, it's very important in the Singapore context, survival in our global economy, knowledge-based. Knowledge and it's very important to, con to turn us from, from consumers to creators. I mean, we never coordinated what we were talk, and a lot of keywords came out the same, right? But they also talk about we should change our mindset from uh, consumers to creators to making, and this is important for future economy. And even a very fundamental thing, I mean, this is the power of pool. I mean, with this pool, with this kind of toilet, really convert what we think is disgusting into a powerful thing to sustain the, the planet Earth. And all this will go back to future economy and also sustainability because you are turning waste to a powerful source for regeneration and so on. This is one of the examples of the mindset of making and creating solutions. And uh, of course it's fun, yeah, it's joyful, it's playful, it's meaningful, it's impactful. And because it's so meaningful, it's impactful, it's purpose driven, and it's never a waste of time making things happen. So it is a mindset that we really want to uh, encourage all of us to embrace and grow. And uh, these are two examples. Earlier on we heard about the, the, the spirometer to measure the, the, the breathing. And here is one that uh, you can come up with a wearable jacket and uh, measure the breathing. And from there, you can uh, help to diagnose uh, pneumonia faster than the doctor can. And I like this example of a uh, like to study by and then because the, the students carry a bag and then when they carry a bag in under hot sun, solar power, when they go back, it was light up and can study next to the bag. And these are innovative ideas. And I think many of them came from makers. And finally, of course, as a science center, we are vision driven and uh, make, making is very aligned with science center's mission. So uh, when I became CEO, I was introduced to the Make magazine and I was told, hey, you should look into this. And we started the Mini Maker Fair and we never turned back. And today, we are very happy that all of you came to support us to 
do this maker tourism. Uh, our mission is to develop human resource, and makers are very creative human resource that we should value and cherish and grow in Singapore. And uh, like Gail, you share many, many makers. I want to just flash quickly. These are interesting makers we made friends with over the years. And, uh, but we were happy to discover him, and then now his creation is all over the place. He is even featured in many, many uh, corporate events, uh, making his paper robots. We have one big one upstairs, still in our corridor, showing his creation. Uh, and uh, this maker, we reconnected with him. He told us a very interesting story. When he was a student, he was a latchkey boy. He always go home on his own, but he found science center. Then he learned science, very important. He became a maker, he became an important man. He is a choreographer between the light and sound in National Day Parade. Okay, and uh, he's our ambassador for many things. And uh, Kiki studied in MIT. He created a uh, Tesla call. Coil, we have one visual Tesla call. He made it for us. Okay, uh, he was a student that we uh, saw. And uh, this maker, he took part in Maker Fair uh, two years ago. He, he showed us something that we liked. We got over the IP and now we mass produce this. Um, and distribute to schools, and schools are using this to learn science and technology through his creation. He's now studying engineering in the United States. Um, this is my final slide. Just to thank all of you, many of you are here, and this is a growing list. Uh, without you, your passion, your commitment, we wouldn't be able to have the Singapore Maker movement uh, moving on. And uh, thank you for coming, and thank you, and I hope that you enjoy the next four days. We have transformed the science center in big ways, and because this is our 14th anniversary, we decided to bring Maker Fair back home. Uh, so, see you in the next four days, and once again, thank you. Thank you for making this thank you. thank you, TM, for sharing on the reasons to embrace making, to embrace life. We next have Mr. Anshul Sonak, Regional Director of Intel Asia Innovation Program, who will speak on how the maker movement can be extended beyond the walls of physical space in his talk, Building Innovation Generation. Just give me a minute to I'm from Intel. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about what we are doing here in Singapore. Uh, good to see a lot of known faces here from local community, civil society, a lot of academic partners I can see in Singapore for me. I can see IT. So thank you all for coming over here in the morning. Uh, I'm, when I was walking in, I was trying to promise to myself that I will not say anything which has already been said by two great speakers earlier. So if I'm saying anything, same thing, just raise your hand and give a signal, okay, so that I avoid that. We all are living in a very exciting time, of course, and uh, with a lot of new technology. So from a, from a corporate standpoint, uh, I mean, Intel being a large uh, technology company, we're also evolving and changing. Uh, we're moving in a world which you can call as a combination of cyber-physical world. The boundaries between biological, cyber, and physical systems are growing, and in that context, uh, you all have to be smart and connected, right? And that's what our vision is. And that's where we believe a maker movement is a very strong complementary force for us. We also are a company of makers and creators and innovators. Because if you don't do that, we will not survive. It is as simple as that. So from that standpoint, this is a very strong complementary force which gives us this humble opportunity to be here and talk about how we inculcate the spirit of making within ourselves and also outside with all our communities, be it academy or <coughs> civil society or maker spaces. A uh, little bit of a context of why this is even becoming more crucial in today's time, and the times are changing very fast. Every two, three years we are seeing a totally new thing uh, 
changing the whole mind, mindset. Uh, I was just doing a research uh, paper study yesterday. Uh, this is from Gartner Hype uh, Technology Hype Cycle. Uh, last year, Internet of Things used to be the most hype uh, term. So it was giving you a lot of new insights, new papers. Just in one year, you know, you'll be very surprised. This year, artificial intelligence has become that. Everybody is talking about the impact of artificial intelligence. What it will be on humanity, what it will be on technology, what it will be on the way we live, work, play, all that. So from that spirit, uh, what you can loosely call as fourth industrial revolution, right? Uh, where cyber physical systems uh, is a new reality. And we are uh, not only in the computing world now, we are in this whole new era of uh, fourth industrial revolution. It's going to create a lots and lots of new opportunities for the world, for all of us. Be it we are maker, academician, government, so on and so forth. Obviously, as we look at it, the big problem which all of us have to think is, we still are not inclusive world. We still are not sustainable world. Right? So there's still a lot of fundamental gaps and divides. Innovation divide being one of them. And within innovation divide, the burden of that divide is more and more on next generation, uh, youth. And when I say youth, I'm loosely using 15 to 24, that age group who deserve the access, who deserve the opportunity, but probably not getting it in what will a 15-year-old boy or a girl in rural Indonesia uh, understand when I say IoT or artificial intelligence, when I say it here? Here probably some of you know about it. But it's very difficult for us to demystify that for a 15-year-old boy or a girl coming from rural Indonesia. I'm just giving that as an example of when we heard about mindset, tool set and skill sets, the three complementary forces which have to work together in maker uh, movement, so to say. What is the task ahead for us? So this is a huge, huge, huge issue, which is why I mean, we from Intel as a responsible corporate want to look at it far more closely and think about how do we make this movement far more diverse, far more inclusive, far more empowered. And uh, I think the need of that conversation is more in this part of the world than anywhere else. Uh, and I, I'm talking of a broader Asia in that sense. I'm not just talking of one country versus another. Broadly in Asia, if you think about it, uh, demography-wise, I mean, we are sitting on a very strong de demographic dividend. 60% of the world youth live in this part of the world. But 50% of that is uh, either unemployed or un uh, un uh, underemployed, so to say. Extreme poverty, extreme situations, extreme inequality, and uh, you can argue that innovation divide is fueling that inequality, is adding to that. So this is where, I mean, there's a big question for all of us to think through. The second big question, a lot of new challenges which world is seeing, uh, which you can argue are probably created also by this technology divide or innovation divide. The burden of that is also coming more in this part of the world. So uh, climate change is a good example, right? And also, uh, it's not just this part of the world. We are also passing on that burden to our next generation. And hence in that context, the importance of maker movement is becoming so more significant that they become problem solver, they become creator. And as I said rightly, it's not just about technology consumer, but it's about technology creator. And I hope I, that's the only thing I'm repeating from previous two speakers, but because it's so, so, so critical that next generation become problem solver. Otherwise, we are going to pass on all these big problems. Problem of energy, problem of uh, healthcare, problem of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, pollution, so to say, so and so forth. So this is where, I mean, more and more maker mindset is definitely required, more so in this part of the world, you would say. Uh, that's our mission from Intel standpoint. And that's where we are saying, how do we expand this access to movements like maker um, mission or maker movement, right? So that everybody, irrespective of gender, irrespective of uh, economic background, irrespective of uh, whichever ethnicity you may be coming in, you get equal access to technology skills. So closing technology skills gap for the next generation has to be a very, very important uh, collective responsibility for all of us. And hence in that context, maker movement, uh, we look at it far more seriously and create programs around that with our academy partner. And some of you are in this room. We do many other things besides uh, maker. Uh, there's a program called Make Tomorrow. Uh, just to give you a flavor, we have a gender focus program. We have a higher education program for this. We have some of this future skills program about things like IoT, artificial intelligence. 
But wait tomorrow is a very, very significant investment or program. We should look at it not just as one corporate trying to make a change or try a program, but as a collective responsibility and working together to co-share and co-create this new movement. That's why this Made Tomorrow as a program from our side uh, is very integral in countries like Singapore and uh, many other nearby countries. In Singapore context, at least, I mean, as I said, we are working very closely with a lot of academia partners here, ITE, uh, Singapore Poly, many other schools ecosystems, so to say. We have a partner here, Sustainable Living Lab, who is also going to speak about what they are doing in, in co-shaping this movement in this country. Basically, the whole idea is how to get this 15, 16 year old guys, young people, to become more innovator, more creator, more problem solver, more authentic maker, so to say. And in, in that context, I mean, we, we, we are new, I would say just a couple of years in this effort, a long journey, and the journey has just started giving us a lot of learning. Uh, coaching, for example, the things which he said earlier, people may have a lot of good ideas, right? but how do we really help them, empower them more? to become a very strong maker. I think it's a process. There's no magical answer to this. And this is where we are investing a lot of our R&D time or thinking time. How do we really create this conducive environment in Asian countries? Uh, learning content is another example. Uh, what kind of a content they will need if you have to demystify what is IoT or what is making technology, so and so forth. Uh, I just want to talk very quickly about a couple of good examples of impact, which I believe is the right outcome to hope, right? And of course, they said that it's not just about an outcome, it's about what they are doing for themselves. So that, making it personal, right, is a very, very solid starting point. In any case, in any moment, no moment will grow if you just force a corporate or a government thinking on top of it. It has to be personal. Right. Uh, uh, my favorite example is of these two girls from, again, a rural Indonesia, who said that, okay, we have to go for work. But when we go for work, our clothes which are hanging outside, and when rain comes, uh, they become wet again, and the, uh, the time and effort of my mother goes west. So what do we do? So they use very simple microbeads and microcontrollers to create automated clothes line, which use rain sensors. So as soon as the rain comes, in their upstairs, the clothesline automatically pulls back the clothes. Boom! Imagine a 16-year-old girl from rural Indonesia thinking like that and creating a technology to solve their problem. It's not about creating a business or creating something big. It solves their problem of ensuring that the clothes come back home and come back inside you. We're using very simple rain uh, sensors. So things like that, making it very personal. I have another example from Singapore. Uh, because in Singapore, I mean, uh, we, we got this uh, project from uh, NTU, if I'm correct. A couple of students who said that in Singapore, uh, you know, orthopedic medical device ecosystem has to grow. There has to be a lot of new IP creation. And they did a lot of research after they came into our maker uh, events and maker uh, platforms, so to say, and found a startup now last year called Connexus. And uh, this kind of do a very early gate analysis they created a variable actually for a joint replacement surgery recovery faster. And now they are working with the local medical communities and medical ecosystem. So this is how two ecosystems come together and create new wealth, hopefully new job. They are new, so I won't say that they have created many jobs, but at least that's the thing, that's the right step to take. So these are the two examples which I always want to appreciate. These are the ways by which maker movement will really help contribute, be it for individual or be it for society, so to say. Uh, the best way to do this is share. It's about show and tell, and that's where I mean, Dale talked about maker share platform a lot. So we, we are very aggressively, I mean, be it in the schools or colleges here, talking about it, and we sincerely, humbly request all of you to go and have a look on this platform. Register yourself. Think about how do you want to help Malia. We talked about Malia's uh, problem. Think about how do you want to showcase your own work portfolio so that we grow this community. Uh, that's where I think our current mind is in Singapore, and I'll be very happy to talk to you folks offline. The belief here is, I mean, don't just be encumbered by what is already happening. Go off and you can yourself do a lot of new things, wonderful things. That's what our one of our founder, legendary founder said from Intel side, uh, would uh, request you to go and have a look on makershare.com and help us grow this movement. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I want to show them a video of what a 15-year-old guy I mean, from my ethnicity, of course, Indian, 
actually did with this. I'm sorry, I closed my laptop, so give me a minute. Thank you, Aisho. And we are very excited about how these new initiatives will impact the society over the coming years. Our next speaker is Mr. Leong King Tai, Deputy Chief Executive for Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore, IMDA, who will be sharing perspectives on how the maker community plays an important role in making Singapore ready for the digital revolution. Just as a personal note, uh, I'm here maybe a few decades too late <laughs> because when I was a secondary school student many, many years ago, decades ago, I, I think I would consider myself a maker because uh, at the time I was very curious with electronics, with physics and uh, a group of friends always get together on the weekends and try to make something. So we made amplifiers, we made a telescope. Uh, I think the most uh, ambitious and perhaps disastrous experiment was to try and make an electric arc lamp. Imagine step-up transformer, two carbon tips getting too close together. It was uh, a bit disastrous and uh, dangerous. But nonetheless, I think I learned a lot of it, learned a lot from all those experiments and I uh, ultimately became uh, sort of very interested to study engineering. So uh, I think talking to this group uh, today, uh, I don't think I need to spend too much time about convincing you uh, the power of technology, the disruption that are upon us, uh, all of us take Uber, all of us exper uh, experience disruption in uh, many ways in our daily lives. So really, uh, some would say that uh, we are at the brink or in fact we are at the start of the fourth uh, industrial revolution. Oops. So just a quick example, um, you know, some of you may have heard of this uh, company called Hollinger, <coughs> which is a really a fashion retail store uh, 
in the United States. I think this is one of the earlier first examples of a, a, a store like this using technology to uh, to really bring about a new form of experience for both online shopping combined with uh, in-store shopping. Uh, so using mobile phones, you can uh, scan a product and you can get reviews or you can even submit your reviews. If you like it, you'll be sent automatically to the fitting room. You try it out and then you decide to buy it. You just uh, scan uh, the product and you pay for it uh, with your credit card on the way out. Totally a uh, new experience. In fact, recently I also saw a video uh, that someone sent me where Alibaba has also transformed a new shopping, supermarket shopping experience in somewhere in uh, one of the cities in China. Uh, if you do check it out, uh, you'll be quite amazed how technology has transformed. You know, just simple chores like shopping, you know, like, you know, taking public transport, etc. So really, disruption, this is all about disruption. And really in this uh, landscape, uh, skills is therefore very important. So in fact, um, there has been a, a report by the World Economic Forum, Future of Jobs report published uh, last year, uh, that says that uh, the skills required going forward will be in areas such as uh, complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. And see, so these are the top three uh, most valued skills by 2020. And in fact, it uh, also says that by some popular poll, 65% of children entering primary school today uh, will ultimately end up working in completely new job types that don't even exist today. So therefore, I think this change uh, and disruption is inevitable. And we have to embrace it rather than fight it. And that is where Singapore uh, is a strong believer uh, to use technology to, to transform our economy, transform our society, and of course transform our, gov our government as well. Um, in fact, this uh, transformation started some 30 years ago. Uh, in fact, for those of you who are familiar with Singapore or stays in Singapore, uh, in fact, uh, we, some 30 years ago, we started this journey of trans using technology, using IT, to first transform government and then to with the private sector and of course with the citizen. So technology has played a very important role to help us uh, in this aspect. And uh, <coughs> this is also why we have decided to prepare our people for this digital revolution. Because we want to make sure that ultimately we are creators and masters of technology and not just being consumers. So we want to be able to deploy, use technology to create new products and services. And this is really the heart of our smart nation and digital economy vision. So INDA is working uh, towards this goal in several ways. First is to nurture the next generation of digital creators and makers. Second, to cultivate a community of innovators and creators. Third, to deepen skill sets in the digital economy. And finally, to focus on some of the key technical technology capabilities. So we want to nurture a new generation of digital creators. It is important to equip our people with digital creativity and innovation skill sets that will help our people solve real problem, real world problems and ride the waves of this digital revolution. IMDs has rolled out, has rolled out several <laughs> initiatives to achieve this. So one example would be the Digital Maker Program launched this year, which aims to introduce a simple to use open technology called the Microbit and in fact, I have one in my pocket. Uh, this is a micro bit. Uh, this will be distributed to schools and adults alike. And uh, our plan is to uh, distribute up to 100,000 of these micro bits uh, to schools and communities as part of this two-year program to encourage the digital maker mindset. We've also been introducing coding and computational thinking in our school students through a combination of infocom clubs, competitions and enrichment programs, like code for fun. So some of these programs, uh, students uh, use robotic kits like the uh, Lego Redo, uh, Move, and also microcontrollers such as the microbits, which I show you, as well as the uh, Arduino sets. For preschoolers, starting from the young age of four to six years old, we introduced a playmaker program which aims to inspire uh, young children to play and make technology. 160 preschools have been uh, exposed to these this kinds of tech toys as a, such as circuit stickers and the keyboard robot uh, under this uh, 
clay nickel for them. Uh, in fact, we have also uh, worked uh, collaboratively with the Science Centre Science Center to unveil the Playmaker Studio at Kidstop, which is uh, just next to this building, earlier this year. And that provides a space for children to dabble in hands-on nickel activities and using exciting array of uh, toys and tools. So building communities and promoting cross-pollination between different communities is actually also key. So not just in, in the tech, like technology space itself, but how can we uh, cross-pollinate just technology with other communities, other sectors. And sometimes collaboration among so-called non-traditional partners can produce unexpected results. So one example is that uh, uh, IMDA has supported a TV production house called Beach House Pictures, and they worked together with a startup uh, technology startup called Hyper Lab to pilot the use of uh, VR in primary schools as part of their social studies lesson. So pupils using VR uh, can, whisk, can be whisked away virtually to various locations in Singapore and allow them to uh, explore uh, landmarks such as the Chinese Garden, the Geylang Sarai Market, as well as uh, how uh, contributions by our early settlers to Singapore uh, reflected through this uh, design and architecture of buildings uh, that we see today. So five of these schools took part in uh, this pilot program. And to encourage more of such cross-collaboration, we also established dedicated space to cultivate a community of innovators and creators for new technology and digital media. So for instance, we launched Pixel Studios, this is in the One North area last year, to provide a common place for digital content creators and media professionals to meet like-minded people from diverse backgrounds. Also under the Pixel umbrella, we, we call this a Pixel Labs. Uh, this provides a physical lab laboratory space for promising and innovative Singapore-based startups, individuals and companies to generate new ideas and build prototypes as well as test out their proofs of concept. IMD has also worked with various partners to connect talents across the ecosystem to spark new ideas and collaboration. So, for example, we spearheaded the Smart Nation Innovations Week in May of this year, uh, which is a festival where technology meets innovation. So these events drew more than 22,000 local and inter international participants who came together to discuss trends shaping our world and also to forge new business opportunities. Beyond that, I think it's very important to uh, grow a people capacity for technology skills. For instance, uh, we've started this program called Technology Skills Accelerator, or TESA for short. And under TESA, uh, we spearheaded programs such as uh, the Company Lab Training Program, which basically partners, uh, it's a partnership between IMDA and uh, companies, uh, <coughs> most of them are MNCs, uh, who will therefore help create training places not only for the company's own needs but also create uh, training spaces for people who are interested in this field of technology. And I think this program has proven to be quite successful. We have more than 10,000 people who have gone through this program uh, for upskilling or reskilling. Uh, where is the picture of the. Can I go back? Yeah. Okay, on this slide you see this guy. First, I thought he looked like me, but actually, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> His name is uh, Mr. Alvin Cole. He's 55 years old and he's a security consultant, but he did not start this way. Uh, in fact, Alvin has been a seasoned veteran with 30 years of experience in systems administra administration and technical support, so very much operational. But he challenged himself to pursue a new career in cyber security after being laid off at the age of 54. So Elvin, who's a strong believer in lifelong learning, decided that uh, he wanted to try something new and he, to rediscover some new meaning of a new career. So he completed his own on -the job training to learn new skills in cyber security from scratch. So today he's now enjoying work as a security consult consultant with SD Electronics. So you see this, uh, this, uh, this platform or this framework 
to allow uh, people who may be skilled in uh, traditional technologies, want to learn new technologies, I think we want this, uh, this, this opportunity to be available for people to reskill and retool themselves to prepare for the digital economy. In fact, uh, we have started work uh, to uh, put together a skills framework for ICT, which will replace uh, the existing National Infocom Competency Framework. And this new, this, uh, new skills framework will, of course, address roles of the future. So today we have already identified some IT skills and more than 100 different job roles uh, for the future economy. So we also see potentials for technology capabilities. And IDS has identified four key tech pillars where we think there's great potential for growth for Singapore. One is the immersive media, AI and data science, cyber security and internet of things. So very quickly, immersive media, I think you have seen the example of the power of VR. So really beyond just media and entertainment, immersive media has the potential to transform the way we learn in classrooms as well as even in things like clinical training simulation. In fact, uh, we partnered uh, or we sponsored a partner with uh, Side Effects Asia Pacific to develop a VR tool to train doctors to perform emergency procedures. Well, AI is much talked about. I think the uh, previous speaker uh, identified that this is one of the sort of hot areas today. Um, for instance, uh, a team of NUS undergrad students have created an autonomous underwater vehicle called Bumblebee on top there, top left, we can identify shapes and sizes of objects, retrieve or provide the location of these objects underwater. So the potential for such a technology, uh, using sonars and sensors, etc., uh, can create huge uh, potential for underwater search and rescue work. Uh, government has also announced that Singapore is investing about $150 million over the next five years in AI to solve real-world life problems in different areas such as uh, finance, cyber security, data center operations, logistics, and healthcare. Well, Singapore is one of the most connected digital cities in the world. This opens up tremendous opportunities for the economy, but it also opens us up to one of the most vulnerable countries when it comes to cyber security matters. So cyber security threat is very real. And the latest ransomware uh, attacks uh, have struck governments, advertising agencies, port operations globally and it is still impacting systems uh, worldwide. Singapore has largely uh, survived that attack, uh, but experts say that uh, the worst is not here yet. So it is therefore important that we invest in, secure, in, securing our, in securing ourselves to remain as a trusted, and I think trusted is a very important element in, the, in going forward as a digital economy, because without trust, all the technology consumers won't dare to use those uh, technologies. So investing in trust and cyber security is very key. Inter Internet of Things, I think, has been talked quite a lot about. Uh, we are also uh, paying some attention uh, to IoT, especially in the areas of smart energy grids, smart transport systems, and of course, I think we have, we have also done quite a lot of experiment, experiments in autonomous vehicles. So really, to conclude, Digital disruption will continue well into the future. Uh, but I think finally, at the end of the day, how, what, the, what the relevance of the maker community uh, to the digital economy going forward is that I think, uh, as I was talking to Dale earlier, uh, this is almost like educating everyone in science and maths. Many of us don't end up as scientists, uh, mathematicians, but I, don't, I think those core skills are so fundamental to daily life, in the way we think, how we analyze, and how we solve problems. But that was the traditional world. I think the new digital world, the digital economy, the new disruption, will require us to have these kinds of uh, maker mindset to create things, to solve problems differently, and therefore that, I, I think uh, we support such a movement, not only because I think it is an important educational uh, framework for fun, for creativity, but I think it has a strong link to the economy of Singapore for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kintai, for sharing on the importance of digital making, forging a future ready Singapore. The maker movement is indeed a worldwide grassroots movement that is pervasive across many countries. 
This will be further explored by our next speakers, Mr. Lucas Griffin and Ms. Mary Leroy. Their talk titled, Empower the Impact of Makerspaces, Overview of Make Tour Asia Exploration, documents makerspaces across Europe and Asia. Hello everyone. Uh, well, first, thank you very much for uh, letting us uh, be here today. I mean, we discussed with, uh, with Dr. Kiro a few months ago already, so it's a real pleasure for us to be here. Um, actually, so uh, we will present you Maker 2 in a few seconds. We are a young organization uh, uh, of two years old. And uh, actually, it was, it's such a good occasion for us to be here that if you don't mind, we might take a short selfie with you guys. <laughs> So, um, make our tour. So we are, uh, we are uh, maybe as you noticed, we are French. Um, we are two uh, young uh, non-profit organizations of two years old, and um, we share a common passion. So this is this is our team, and uh, we are a team of uh, of volunteers. We are an open community, and we all share uh, the same passion for uh, making. So we are, we are makers and we uh, basically believe in two, uh, two main things. Uh, the first one is uh, fabrication collaborative workshops. So we believe in the maker movement for its power to uh, bring people together and to make them work on common projects. And um, those common projects might even lead to uh, solve the issues from the 21st century. So that's the first thing we believe in. And for that, we want to help uh, local uh, communities so uh, fabrication workshops, uh, mostly known as Fab Labs or, or Makerspace, to connect together and to share their ideas and their knowledge to help them grow at a, at a faster pace. And the second thing we believe in is um, the importance and the necessity to uh, spread the word about making. Because uh, truth is that probably, uh, I mean, we all know uh, about uh, making, about Fab Labs, about uh, Makerspace, but uh, Probably 90% uh, of, the, of the rest of the world might not know uh, about it and might not know about its potential. So it's very important for us to show concrete examples of what can be achieved in such places, um, to inspire people and to, uh, ins and to uh, give them the, the chance to uh, cross the, the door of uh, such uh, collaborative workshops. So um, how do we do this? Um, we have uh, three. Um, I mean, we we have an action in three steps basically. The first thing is that we our open community explores um, fabrication collaborative workshops. So we go into uh, into those places to meet the people to understand how they uh, how they work, and we document um, based on the methodology we have uh, we have designed and which I will uh, I will show you in a second. We document how they work. And every documentation we make for every space is uh, fully available on our platform online, so makertour.fr. Um, regarding the methodology, so to show you a bit uh, how we do, uh, it's based on, uh, on six main pillars. So in every, in every uh, space we go, uh, we spend usually three days. And uh, the first thing we document is the mission, because we know that uh, a lab or a community of makers uh, usually, most of the time, as a, as a purpose, or some um, even uh, uh, several purposes, but it's very important to understand why they are uh, they are doing what they uh, what they do. And the second point is the users. So uh, we document who are the users, uh, why do they come into this uh, community, and what they are looking for. The third point is uh, pedagogy and animation. It's it's more about how the space, how the maker space is helping or is uh, putting process in processes in place to help the, uh, the users to develop their project or to, to, uh, to develop their skills. Wow. <laughs> 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 and the first one is the documentation part. Uh, it's, it's always a starting point. It's the, uh, we document how the spaces are putting, um, are documenting their project and sharing it them with uh, with the world. And the fifth one is the <coughs> business model. It's more um, when we say business model, it's more about understanding how those uh, 
those communities are uh, designing themselves to be sustainable in time. Um, and the fifth and the last one are uh, the projects. So uh, uh, basically, how everything started. Um, well, it started as every uh, very good story with a traveling adventure. So uh, our community uh, went uh, two years ago uh, to meet 50 uh, collaborative workshops uh, in France and Europe. So we, t we traveled and uh, met those 50 labs and documented them and everything um, has been put uh, available online on our uh, platform makerpro.fr. So if you're trying to access it on your mobile, I'm, I'm sorry in advance because it's not responsive uh, anymore. I mean, we had some issues, but it will be, uh, it will be very soon. Um, and the, uh, after, so after the success of the first exploration, a lot of people uh, came to us and we started to exchange about, uh, because we saw that it created connections between labs, because as we put all the information online, uh, labs start to uh, look for uh, what others were doing and they understood that they have, they often face uh, common challenges or common ideas actually, even if they are in different countries. And by sharing those uh, challenges together, they can like learn at a faster pace and also avoid to reinvent the wheel in some ways. So um, um, we decided to launch a second expedition in, uh, in Asia this time. So Mary and I had the chance to uh, travel for eight months from uh, Iran to uh, Japan. And here you can see that we are right in the middle of our uh, journey, actually, in Singapore. And uh, we already met 20, uh, 20 labs across uh, across four countries, so I, actually we can show you uh, a So we, we have been in uh, Iran uh, at first, where we met two labs, where the maker movement is kind of uh, in, its, uh, in its infancy. Um, then we traveled in Nepal, a very interesting country, where we documented three labs, more focused on education and solving humanitarian needs, um, especially linked to uh, the um, uh, earthquake that happened in 2015, so to bring humanitarian response. Then in India, where the maker movement is literally booming, so we had the chance to document 12 spaces here, and there are much more to, uh, to come. I mean, I can just uh, quote that the Indian government has a, a plan called the Atal Tinkering Lab, and they are going to uh, build more than 500 maker spaces into schools as of uh, next year. Um, and finally, Vietnam, um, where uh, a, a very good way to, uh, to uh, bring the maker movement to uh, all cities and rural areas has been done by the Saigon Fab Lab, who has built a mobile Fab Lab and is traveling uh, across the country since, uh, since two years already. So um, based on that, we thought it might be interesting to share with you a few of, uh, of the highlights that we have, uh, that we have, that we have noticed uh, since the start of our, of our journey in Asia. And I'm going to let uh, Marie tell you more about that. Thank you. So, till now, we, so today we've already documented 19 labs in Asia. So, um, we've noticed, we've identified three main missions, actually. The first one, um, the first one is, so we find out that makerspace, a lot of makerspaces try to uh, compensate the lack of, um, let's say, let's say hands-on and learning while doing education in their country. The second mission that we saw a lot is that a lot of labs want to uh, bring the right tools, machines, and community to individuals to help them to um, deliver the right solutions for local needs. And the third one, and booming one actually, that a lot and a lot of makerspaces try to foster technological innovation thanks to cutting edge machines and strong networks. So we, okay. so we found some uh, examples. So here is the example of the Karkana makerspace in Kathmandu. They are 100% dedicated on education. They really want to revolutionize the education in Nepal. How do they do? Actually, they, um, they develop um, hands-on and learning while doing STEAM workshops for more than 1,500 uh, students uh, from 8 to 14 years old per week. So that's pretty huge. The second example we have, it's a Nepal Innovation Lab. This, so this is both a maker space and an incubator uh, which focuses on humanitarian topics. 
So thanks to this lab, we have the example of Feed Ready. It's a non-profit organization that uh, they, they, they developed the, um, let's say, a low-tech 3D printer kit. Thanks to that, a uh, rural population in Nepal can uh, upload medical devices and pipe fittings on an offline application and print it with their low-tech 3D printer that can be plugged to a car battery or a solar panel. So they don't need electricity. Really inspiring. So thanks to the Pan Innovation Lab, they um, empower the local population. The last example we have in terms of mission is IKP Eden. IKP Eden is one of the biggest incubator, um, hardware incubator in India. It was created three years ago and they uh, foster technological innovation uh, with cutting edge uh, machines and tools, a huge maker space, and a um, very strong network of experts. So today, there are more than 32 hardware startups located in that four-story building in Bangalore. So now let's talk about the users. I think you won't be surprised if I tell you that 70% of the users are male students with an IT background. So there's still a lot of things to do. Um, most of them come, come in the labs to develop their school projects, to uh, learn new skills, but also, and more and more, to uh, launch their own startup. Uh -huh. And we've noticed with Lucas that, com contrary to Europe, there are not a lot of hobbyists. In terms of pedagogy now, so uh, we saw that a lot of makerspaces try to develop partnerships with schools. Uh, we have the example after uh, of Curiosity Gym. This makerspace, located in uh, Mumbai, um, develops innovation hubs inside schools. Those innovation hubs provide workshops um, that are integrated into the students' curriculum. Then we have the example, no, um, more than one third of the makerspaces we saw try to develop their own incubator and accelerator. It's a huge trend that we saw a lot in, uh, in India. We have the example here of uh, Rhythm. Rhythm is a makerspace located in a university, Somalia University, and they developed the first hardware, hardware innovate, incubator um, in 2015. So this incubator hosted more than uh, 40 startups uh, focused on smart technologies, so social, mobile, analytics, and uh, cloud technologies. We, hear, we have here the example of uh, Square Off, maybe you've heard of it. It's one of the smartest chessboard uh, ever shown, and uh, it was created here. And then 100% of the makerspaces we saw um, delivered workshops and events, of course, for individuals and corporates. Let's talk about the documentation. So documentation is quite tricky for most of the makerspaces we documented, either because it's time consuming, resource consuming, or because uh, for some labs, it was quite frightening you know, to share their information because they want to protect their intellectual property. But we have one example. Uh, the example is FabLab Digen Ashram. Maybe you've heard of it. It's uh, also called FabLab Zero. So it's one of the first fab lab in the world. Uh, so the open source documentation is part of their culture. Each and every student has to document in open source his project from the ID to the production on his own blog. For them, it's a good way, for Gideon it's an excellent way for students not to reinvent the wheel, of course, but also to uh, develop the skills of everyone, even outside the fab lab. And last but not least, let's talk about the business model, which is also a complicated question for most of the labs we documented. You can imagine. <laughs> so, um, actually for one third of the labs we documented, it's not a problem. They don't really care about it, because they are funded by governments or foundations. Look, look at them. Um, but for approximately half of the labs we documented, they, they struggle. They really struggle. 
But we found out that some of them succeeded in fi finding a sustainable business model. Only four of them, actually, but maybe we'll find more. And usually, um, they are successful because they are either um, specialized, mostly in uh, the education field, or they work a lot with corporates. So uh, we have the first example, which is Maker's Box. Maker's Box is located in, um, in Delhi. So within only one year, they, uh, they got break even. So how did they do that? They help schools to create their own maker spaces. They bring their knowledge, their skills, their advice, but they don't pay the rent, they don't pay the wages, uh, nor the, let's say, the customer acquisition costs. Seems easy. Um, and then we have the example of uh, workbench projects. So workbench projects is famous because they are located at the metro station in Bangalore. Um, and then at least 50% of their revenue comes from um, workshops and events organized for corporates. It seems normal, but for us, we didn't see much of the labs in, in Asia that do that. Whereas in Europe, it's quite wi widespread, actually. And let's look at complete. Um, okay, so just as a, as a conclusion for, um, so as you understood, like, we are only half uh, of our journey far uh, regarding maker to asia But just as a short uh, conclusion regarding the labs we had the chance to document in Europe and the one we've done uh, in, in Asia from uh, now, a lot of uh, communities and makerspaces are popping like, everywhere in the world right now, it's a fact. It's also true that uh, sustainability is a real issue uh, nowadays and that a lot of uh, communities are raised in uh, one year and then fall down after two or uh, three years unfortunately. So um, right now the, the movement is, uh, is spreading. Um, it's also time and uh, we know that a lot of organizations are, are doing it but it's time to, uh, to really think and, uh, on how we are going to help um, those communities and those places to uh, share their information but also share their best practices and share what works basically uh, to help them to, uh, to, to grow and uh, empower more people to become makers and, and become innovative. So this is actually, a, this conclusion is more uh, a question mark actually because we don't know how it's going to, uh, to happen. But this is definitely something, and, and just to uh, share with you an example, we know that uh, uh, you might know that an event called Fab 13 will take place in, uh, in Santiago de, de Chile this year. And uh, the question on how to build infrastructure and system to uh, empower the global, uh, the global community will be one of the key questions. So um, we guess this is one point on which anyone who is involved in the maker movement needs to, uh, to think right now. How we are going to help to sh the share of best practices, how we are going to help the share of good projects as well. Because it's something we notice like a lot of communities actually are developing the same uh, kind of projects or similar projects that could be like easily uh, um, shared and scaled. So it's, uh, it's our, uh, our work to, to think uh, on that and um, how we are going to help them in, in, to share it in a relevant manner. And here we, we finish with documentation. Uh, documentation is a very important part of uh, the maker movement because uh, a good documentation allows us to uh, replicate good projects and good ideas. And uh, so this is actually the, the big uh, question mark for, uh, for the list. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas and Marie, on sharing the different trends of maker spaces across Asia and Europe. Our final speaker for this morning is none other than Vera Suminathan, founder <coughs> sorry, Suminathan, of Sustainable Living Lab, one of the young pioneers in Singapore's maker scene. Vera will be talking about building learning communities through purposeful making. Vera, please. So you want to hear from Lucas and Marie, they're having a workshop, this, uh, sorry, a discussion this evening, hosted at our makerspace, it's at 7pm, uh, located at the Community Lab, which is in the east of Singapore, in Singapore College. Um, but let's, let's get started with this. 
Uh, so my name is Vira. I come from Sustainable Living Lab, which is a social enterprise. Um, and we started the first makers in Singapore a couple of years back. Uh, so I think we'll fall into the 20% of businesses that are still surviving in the makerspace scene. Uh, indeed, a lot of them actually have, have uh, moved on to other things as well. Um, so one of the things that really got us into the maker movement was to try and use making towards more uh, purposeful, meaningful endeavors. Uh, and there's a I think, recurrent theme that has come up several times today. So you all know this, we live in a VUCA world, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And in particular, uh, this sort of world means that, um, you know, to survive it, we will need to come together as a community. And we all know this, obviously, but we have some uh, problems with that, right? We have uh, families that are nuclear. We have uh, our basic needs being met. So we don't really need to depend on anybody. We are pretty independent. Uh, we also have, you know, a, a strong promotion of the individual. Where we like to put up people on the pedestal and take a picture of them and say, you know what, this individual is so fantastic. And everybody wants to be that individual as well. While it's good, it also creates a sense of individualism. And it sort of contests with the idea of community. Now, if we move to a VUCA world, I think we have to start thinking more in terms of how, as a community, we can lift up. How the community can rise up. Um, so we start with this current situation. So my hypothesis is basically you know, that purposeful making, or making it done purposefully, is really a, a good way you know, for community building. So and again, I think, I think this uh, train of thought is something that we've had for a long time in starting our organization, but only in recent years have we managed to manifest this in, in, in reality and being able to gather evidence of this. This is very sensitive, most of you. All right, so firstly, while learning communities, um, they are basically self-directed groups uh, where people come together, uh, seek knowledge, and, and share each other. And communities don't just form. I mean, so uh, one of the things people say, what's the difference? What makes a community? Uh, gathering people in a place uh, does not make a community. I mean, like we're all here in this place today, but we're not really a community yet. We're not a community yet until we do stuff together, until we have goals together, until we achieve things together. Um, so similarly, communities have to be designed. Someone has to put it together. It can be the first person who initiates it. It can be the first follower who comes down to follow it. And communities in particular, learning communities, you know they've done well when the knowledge they started off with, they exceed that. Right? When they exceed that, you know you've done well, you know that the community is sustaining, that there is some kind of momentum or engine of growth behind it. So these are some examples of learning communities uh, we have uh, organized over the years. Uh, all of these are continuing, actually. Uh, some are running into the three-year mark. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, some of these communities. So one of them is Tech Saturdays. Tech Saturdays is a community they basically experiment with the latest technologies and with the idea of trying to put them towards advancing any of the sustainable development goals, any of those. Uh, they don't always do a good job at it, but they try. They try very hard. And uh, right now they're trying to build uh, bio lab equipment because some of these things are pretty expensive. And you will see some of the half working items at Mega Fair as well because they couldn't complete it in time. They're still working on it tonight. In fact, I stayed over the lab last night. I slept over the couch and then I came over here. Right. So uh, the other thing that happens also is uh, we have make educators forming communities as well to share best practices, learn each other how to manage a classroom, especially with 40 students and 40 different interests. We have one educator. Right, this is a classic problem that educators have, uh, make educators have. Uh, with the urban farming, or rather heartland farmers, they're basically trying to build a rooftop farm. They're trying to build one as a business. They've not done a farm before, they've not done a business before either, right? Uh, but they come together with that intention, and they've done pretty well. In fact, in terms of the most uh, uh, fastest growing learning community, I would say the Hudson Farmers Group has done really well because of its two leads, uh, Kenneth and Daniel. Uh, and Daniel's actually a bus driver, so he's a bus driver. Uh, and, and basically, they managed to, to push it to the level which is quite amazing. In, I think in just three months now, uh, they've already have a sort of working Dutch bucket system of 25 meters. But what I'm going to dive into in some detail is the Repair Kaki Group. Uh, this Repair Kaki Group is an offshoot of the Repair Kobitiam program that we have been running for a long time. So Repair Kopitiam, uh, Kopitiam is, is coffee shop or cafe for colloquial language, uh, but it's a program to address the and throwaway culture in Singapore. Singapore is a highly affluent society, people just throw away stuff all the time. We want to get people to repair these things and not throw them away. 
so of course you can look at it in terms of reducing the amount of waste going towards landfill, reducing the amount of e-waste, and I think uh, just generally saving money and having a lot of fun. Now this particular initiative as we've done it over the years, uh, we have found some things about it and, and with that in mind, the Repair Kaki program was started as a collaboration with Kutepa Hospital uh, and their Kampung Wellness Group uh, together with Repair Kupitia. So what happens in this uh, kind of uh, uh, Repair Kaki group actually is that uh, people who are in the Kampung Wellness Group, uh, staff of the hospitals uh, and even the community around the area, they come together and they learn how to repair things and they offer a form of service at the end of the day. So this, I mean a couple of key features there. First thing is that what's called a tree of knowledge, right? So everyone puts in what they know uh, at the start of the program and then the sort of then that's at the root of the tree. And at the top of it, the fruits and all that are basically what are things they want to learn, what they want to move towards. So it's one of the first things that we do at every session, uh, have them fill up the tree of knowledge. And we write in Mandarin as well. I don't understand what that says. I hope it says something not rude. Okay, but uh, <laughs> anyone wants to say it? Well, it's uh, this guy knows how to examine the plants. Okay. And he, he will say that you check whether the views are okay, not broken. All right. And then uh, then you need to understand and uh, uh, don't don't waste or, or let 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 the let the instruction take take place. Right. No worries, no worries. But thanks, thanks very much. Now I can always say that one thing. <laughs> but you know, people write down what they know, what they learn, what they already understand, and then um, over the course of the next couple of weeks, they sort of try and build upon that. So it's sort of baseline first. Um, and the other thing about the Repair Kaki program is that it's really the authentic form of intergenerational learning. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting is that in making you don't know, talk a lot. And in Asian studies, you don't like to talk a lot, especially the men. Older men don't like to talk very much. Uh, and, and, and it helps that if you do community programs, uh, usually you'll find that the men will not really participate. In fact, this is a common problem identified by PA. Uh, all the aunties will come and join the programs, all the men will not. And they will not because they don't feel like they want to you know, be all extrovert about it and talk to people and so on. They want to be doing things, but they like the company, like other people doing things along with them. Uh, so I think making has a very special place in trying to get certain groups of people involved. And I think the third thing is that as uh, you back group, a lot of them are of course elderly, uh, a good 60% of them are about age of 55. They have this, I mean, feelings of uselessness. I mean, I, I think the rice market example given by problem is a, is a good way of putting it. Um, and you know, they like to find use for the So being able to make people repair things and being able to successfully repair somebody uh, that gives them a great deal of satisfaction. Uh, people really look forward to coming in, and they have like WhatsApp chat groups. People actually download WhatsApp to be able to use it in order to join the groups. Uh, and you'll find them trying to adopt smartphone technology and all this, learning how to Google, only because they are trying to serve their purpose. And that sort of drives a lot of uh, the work, drives a lot of the self-directed learning, so to speak. And you know you have, you have surpassed me when they start making circuit breakers. We don't teach circuit breakers, by the way, because we are actually not uh, we don't have an LEW license, what do you call a licensed electrical worker, so we'd be sued if we started teaching how to build circuit breakers and all that. Uh, so people doing their own, we don't mind. Uh, and they started doing this on their own, they started making their own circuit breaker set uh, for the repair program. And uh, so we know at this stage typically they start going a little bit beyond what we have seeded them with into creating their own types of knowledge. And uh, I want to just uh, take this article, this is from an article uh, called Breaking Social. Uh, they basically interviewed some doctors. We didn't know this article came out, it came out in February. Uh, the program only started later after that, but uh, one of the things I identified as I said, is that you know, the idea of uh, social isolation, and this is a big problem in the uh, fast aging population, you know, like in Singapore, uh, like in, even in I think East Asian countries as well, you have this situation. Social isolation will only increase. Uh, I think making and done purposefully at a community level can really break through that in a way that a lot of other types of mechanisms uh, will not be able to. Because you can get all age groups together, you get real intergenerational kind of reactions, uh, collaboration going on, and you have some kind of uh, meaningful to it. Not sort of a uh, contrived meaning, but real meaning. Trying to save money, trying to repair things, trying to get things working again, or even trying to you know, make somebody happy, or, or solve money as problem even, right? Those sort of things. And 
in particular, what's interesting is that you wonder what a hospital like Kutikpa was going to repair, right? I mean, so yes, they get a real chance of that repair, and that's a great advantage to them. But they also want to find a way of sending other messages. And you want to find, if you can get people together somehow, get a hook, right? Then you can basically share other things with them. And particularly, they sell a lot of messaging on diabetes, on health checkups, and so on. And people do really respond to that in the group. So I'm actually in this group of all seniors down here. I don't know what I'm doing there, but you'll see them send us messages on this. Have you had a checkup yet? Have you done this yet? And they're reminding each other to basically do these things. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see this because I think uh, as I'll get older eventually, right? And we're all using this now, so I don't know what I'll be using next time. But you know, I, think, I think seeing how seniors adopt and use technology to live their lives in present day uh, gives me a lot of ideas of how I would use it in my own old age as well. So this is sort of a cycle of what it takes to form a learning community. I put this up because um, people think community building is just, ah, community building. People like to always make fun of uh, the ex-president Barack Obama and say that, ha, he's just a community organizer, what does he know? Okay, so I want to tell you what it takes to organize a community. It's not so simple, and I have new respect for these people who do such work. So uh, first thing, I think every community is a clear, established goal, you need an intent, or a niya, as they'll say in Arabic, uh, for them to work towards. And you need to gather people around the intent. And weekly, only weekly works. You can't do monthly, you can't do once every two weeks, you can't do once every two months. We attract every single one of those things weekly. You have to do it weekly because people think in weekly routines. And you want to make it part of life, you need to make it a routine. So weekly works the best way. And then you see the initial knowledge. So having people come together but not having organized means that people, some people will feel left out and all that and they will, and they will leave after a while. So you need to facilitate the first few sessions they're coming together. And like I said, this thing takes about eight or ten weeks. Somebody's coming, facilitate a little bit, see them with some initial knowledge, put them in a stable position so that eventually they are not coming for the knowledge, but they're coming for the friends they make over there. And then you know you're sort of turned a corner uh, with the learning community. And once you turn the corner, you gotta try and keep the knowledge going, extend it by having them use WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever mechanisms they, 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 they want to use. But use it off session, during the week, send some stuff, uh, send some publications, send some new knowledge. And we do things like this, we call people who are active in the group and ask them to share instead. So it creates a sense that, hey, it's actually okay to share. People don't feel pretty safe you know, to share. They don't mind sharing, they don't mind coming in with other things. And finally, once you've normalized it, you've got to measure, celebrate it. And of course, the impact, the kind of goals you want to achieve as a group can expand. You can move to other things as well. And then you let it go uh, from then on. So uh, what it means to seek knowledge, uh, generally we have a certain kind of framework we've arrived at, uh, what we call a 20, uh, 70, 10%. So a 20% exposition, people will talk at you, tell you this is what the content we're going to do today, etc. is. 70% they are practicing self-directed learning. Now the first few lessons is always a disaster because they will not learn anything, they'll be very confused and everything. But uh, usually you walk them through it, but the thing is that having them practice it routinely week after week after week, it becomes part of the habit. One of the scariest things to repair is that you never know what you're going to get. Someone can come and give you an air fryer and it's like, I have never seen an air fryer in my life before, and this person standing in front of me expecting me to repair this. And then you, you don't want to look like an idiot, right? So it's like, I want to figure it out somehow. Uh, and how do you think on your feet? How do you overcome your fear? Well, you're going to overcome your fear every week, 70% of the time, right? And there's going to be an exam, assessment, exam, quiz, to make sure they learn and listen. I wish I had the assessment all of you over here, wondering if you listen to all the, all the speakers today. But this assessment is really useful because it helps remind people of, of the knowledge, helps people uh, uh, sort of, you know, remember each other and, and pick up the key principles. We are all very forgetful and we need regular testing, regular assessments, every lesson in fact, or every one hour in fact. So this system, we use Google Docs, Google Slides, all the activity sheets, all the usual stuff all free and open source tools, you can also use it. Uh, and these things are easily available. So these things of course take place in an environment. The environment we have this at is the community lab. Uh, this is the ninth makerspace we have uh, helped design. We've done makerspaces in, in all parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, this is one we actually operate. It's inside the uh, United World College. Not the Dover campus which is near here, but the East campus in Tampines. And for this particular lab is focused on the sustainable development goals and getting the community to work on them. So like every lab has an intent to it and that's the intent for this particular lab. 
So, in fact, it is at this lab that uh, Lucas and Marie will be basically having a uh, session later today. All right. Uh, so, in Google Lab Community Lab, we in Google Lab Sustainable Living Lab. Either way, look for the events, and then you will see it over there. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vera, for sharing about the growth of purposeful making in our local scene, creating sustainable communities. I'm sure that our, our audience is burning with questions at this point. We will now invite all the speakers for our panel discussion. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Andrew Giger from Science Centre Singapore. Can all the speakers come up, please? Just while we wait for the, the complete panel to arrive, uh, let me give my own summary of this. Uh, I think we're going to follow, uh, follow Vera's pattern. So this is the, the last 10% of our time is assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to ask some questions to assess both the speakers as well as, as uh, the audience. But maybe I share from my personal experience I don't, I'm not sure that I should say this here, but I don't consider myself a maker. Uh, I was always a bit skeptical about the makers movement um, because I couldn't quite understand what's so special about makers because we all make things, right? I make a lot of things. Uh, I build stuff from, from materials, I, I build software and, and all sorts of things just for fun. So I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, Mr. Young mentioned that he was do building uh, rockets and, and, and telescopes and, and things um, long before the maker movement came along. So what's so special about makers? Uh, but I got a few answers today in, in this session. Um, I think the three main threats that I, that I got was first one is community. Uh, if I build stuff by myself, that's fun for me, but um, building a community around it is a lot more powerful. And I think from all the, the presentations, I, I, I got that. Um, <coughs> linked to that is also inclusion. Um, I may be a personally inclined to, to build stuff and, and, and have motivation to do so, but this is useful for other people who, who may not be doing it by themselves, but if, if you have a community and if you have <coughs> people that uh, usually reach out and try to pull more people in, um, that's another big benefit of the maker movement. And finally, that develops skills and skill sets for future generations to contribute to the, to the nation as well. So, okay, um, I'm sure there's questions in the, in the audience now that we have. Okay. Final again. Any questions? My name is Ratish. I I come from India um, to attend Make a Fair Singapore. This is uh, my first Make a Fair experience in my life. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one of the questions to Dale is to understand, you know, um, the culture of the maker moment. Um, because I've been to Shenzhen and I'm, I'm actually seeing that it's it's transformed to um, prototyping as a service. Um, so what's the difference between the maker culture and um, you know prototyping uh, as a service? That's one question. Uh, that I'd like to learn about. The other is to maybe you guys to understand 
um, because you've been to India and you've been to a lot of uh, maker spaces and I've started doing a reke myself and I see a lot of people um, go from a tool based approach, uh, get a lot of tools and then start making uh, and some of them have started doing a product uh, based approach, uh, like a menu card of um, what are things that you can make and therefore then what tools that so if you can tell me about that it would be great thanks okay um so i think i use the i would use the term maker culture to be inclusive of things like business but not um, simply business right so i think when we look at things from uh, that are part of the maker movement. Um, one of the ways I look at what technology has enabled is it's a kind of prototyping re revolution. Like you can take an idea and make the first iterations of that idea in a physical form, right? Uh, more cheaply, more accessibly for more people. So that, that's really a difference maker. That means that people with ordinary ideas can just, with low amounts of uh, capital, can create something and begin to share that and see if it is worthwhile going on that process. Shenzhen is, is well equipped to help scale into production from prototype to production. I, I think the maker movement done in a maker space anywhere can get you to prototype level, but you know, once you start to make lots of something, you start to look at where you have factories and things to do that. But in between the prototype to production, there's kind of a, what I call small batch production. And that's what I would like to see more locally um, in lots of places. Like, let's say you do a Kickstarter and you promise a thousand of something, right? And you figure out your process to make a thousand and it has a lot of hand steps in that. But suddenly you get 10,000 orders. That's a big bump and your hand process doesn't work anymore. So you need another way. But you're not ready to order a million of those things. like. You would go to Shenzhen to get a million, but not 10,000. So th there's some real gaps and hurdles that you have to do, but this is about a business process of making more than one of something. But prototyping is, in a sense, making one of something, right? And then being able to iterate. So if you go back to culture, um, culture has, to me, like when I use the term in my book, free to make, it means, you know, it, for, making is a form of creative expression, as a taking an idea and expressing it as an artist would, as a maker would, as a, you know, all those things. Um, um, we are creating a culture in doing that. And the culture is also these attitudes like mindsets, but um, uh, the fact that you can participate in a creative culture is, is I think, the, the real important thing. And that's what I think we're trying to show in Maker Fair is that there are all kinds of ways to participate um, in terms of idea, uh, you know, subjects or categories or, or uh, projects that you may just see a connection between two things and say, well, that's my idea now to, to make that. And that does not have to originate as a business. It may, what I find sometimes happens at Maker Fair is someone has a project and the feedback they get is, oh, I'd like to buy that. That's really cool. You know, well, I, I just made it for myself, but now I'll switch gears and start thinking about that. So, um, but I, I will say in China, for instance, in the Shenzhen Maker Fairs and you know the uh, early ones I've been to, and it, may, it changes actually by city there. But you know, people tended to make something because they had the tools to make them, and they tended to be more identical rather than innovative. So I can make a drone. And I go up and ask someone, what's, you know, there's a row of 10 people with drones. And I say, why is your drone different than his drone? And they look at, like I'm asking a silly question. It's like, they're the same, but I made this one, right? <laughs> but you mean it doesn't do anything different than his? No, but like, people want drones, and this is a drone, and I made it. So, so you know, there's some gift in changing, like, like I think, no, I'm not trying to fault them, but part of it is, from an economic necessity, they see um, a, a need in the market. People are buying drones, so I can make a drone. I think the real gift in some in around innovation is seeing things that don't exist and then making those. Um, and a lot of them will fail, but some of them may succeed. Um, 
okay, so just to make sure I, uh, we understand clearly your, uh, your question um, before answering, so it was about to, uh, to uh, know if uh, amongst all the makerspaces we've seen so far in India, um, if the users were more coming because they had a project in mind and they want to find tools to make something, or if they were just coming to learn about uh, like making and, uh, and uh, digital fabrication for them. Ah, okay. Um, so good question. Uh, actually, so we um, during during our uh, our trip uh, in uh, in India, um, if we had to uh, to come up with like one main trend uh, about maker spaces for us, um, the main is about uh, the main purpose of uh, of uh, make makers community and maker spaces is to uh, is to train people. So it's about education most of the time. So, um, like, um, of course, there are some other examples. Like, for example, well, IKP then is a um, hardware incubator that has been launched in Bangalore uh, one year ago. Uh, probably you, you know about it. So, this one is made for uh, um, high technology uh, incubation and prototyping. So, it's more for uh, people who already have a team and uh, a project and want to, to come to uh, prototype it. But in all the others we've, we've seen, um, people came for workshops. That was the, the first, like the main reason people were coming in makerspaces was because they had some uh, attractive workshops um, on 3D printing, but also on uh, woodworking tool or how to uh, to build a product. And they came because they got interested. And uh, the interesting part uh, that we have seen, for example, in places like uh, Workbench projects in, in Bangalore or. Uh, or uh, even Maker's Box in, uh, in the ERC PT Fab Lab in Ahmedabad, which is quite known. It's, uh, it's a big lab in, uh, uh, dedicated to our architecture. It's that most of the projects that uh, came out um, and that were eventually uh, going into a, into a startup or, or a business uh, were made by people who actually met during the workshops in the lab. Um, and so that, that was very uh, interesting as well because it means that the, the communities and the, the power of the community go even beyond the only fact of, uh, of building education. It also helps people to connect and to create projects together and those projects will eventually create uh, a value, I mean, a value like uh, in an economic perspective but it could also be a, a social one. So that's, uh, that's a very... Uh, I mean, I don't know if it answers the question, but that's that's the, the the biggest trend we've seen in India so far. And I, actually, just um, I, I'm sorry if I'm talking too long. You can tell me, but um, we we met one lab, um, the Project Defy lab. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, ah, you went on them. Okay, well, that's perfect. Um, so this is the a unique model we we have only seen uh, in, uh, in India so far which for us illustrates very well the, the power of uh, a maker's community. Um, so just to, to explain this, and you can tell if, I, if I'm wrong then, because you know uh, you know. Um, so uh, Project Defy uh, set up uh, labs in, uh, in, uh, mostly in, uh, in villages and rural areas uh, in India, with only, and, and even in Bandana, um, only with uh, a $500 initial investment. So it's quite, uh, it's very low for a major space. And basically they, they put, uh, so it's an open place, a physical open place where people can meet with open tools and internet connections and some computers. And there is no, no uh, teachers that just train some mentors who are part of the communities as well and are, are, uh, are physically in the, in the lab. They help people to find informa information on the internet and they let them create their own uh, things. And basically it brings two things. The first one is education. Children uh, who come in the lab are learning very quickly and they make like quite uh, impressive uh, uh, projects. We've seen near Bangalore two uh, young, uh, young boys who made uh, a full aquaponics system without knowing anything about it in, uh, in a few months and without any mentorship, I mean uh, like uh, uh, experts mentorship. And also it creates value because people come in these places to create their own, uh, their own business. So they come because they use the tools and they use internet to create uh, clothes, to create uh, uh, jewelry, to create gadgets, and they create, and so and this is actually value because without the maker space it could not be done, but uh, without the community it could not be done uh, as well. And it creates something completely new out of the $500 investment. So and this is like, uh, if you have the chance to go in their, in, in their website and look at what they are doing, it's a unique model and it's very, uh, very interesting. 
I think this is something that, that strikes me as well, that um, the communities that the makers are in are so diverse. I mean, we, we hear about India, where they really have essentially nothing, and 500 dollars can make a huge difference. <coughs> <laughs> uh, but then, if we, if we compare that to, to, let's say, Singapore or the US, um, the situation would be completely different. People come in for a, for a different reason, I, I suspect. Or uh, am I wrong? I see Dale is a bit skeptical. Well, I think, you know, originally, a lot of like the Fab Labs had like a half million dollar budget. You know, they were kind of built on that model. And it was kind of a, a nice idea that you could replicate and have the same things everywhere. And I thought Makerspace kind of came from a different perspective um, in that, that they, could be, they could be $500 spaces. And, and in fact, if you're going to have it in elementary school, you don't have much of a budget to do this. And it was more important actually creating the space and doing some of this making than it was having 3D printers. And what we've seen is, is you can start at that level and evolve and add those things, but they weren't requirements. It was more people, right? And, 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 and we've seen in some places where they do spend the half a million dollars on equipment, but they don't get the people part right. And so I, I think we overestimate the costs sometimes. And I'd say, again, I saw it important because if, if we only wanted one maker space in the city, maybe you could put a half million dollars into it. But if you needed them where kids spend time, and where people are, uh, you know, you wanted them in lots of places in the community. So the example in the US I see a lot of are libraries. And a lot of them, they have lots of branches. And so they've kind of scaled different models. And I think this is viewing, um, you having like a network model for makerspaces is what we need, you know, different capabilities and this would kind of be interesting along the tour thing is is if people could actually just say I'm I'm like a level one makerspace and this is a level two and this is a level three and what you know the expectations are, are kind of determined by what your budget and resource other resources like human resources are. So I think we see elsewhere that um, and then you know particularly from a starting point that you can start with with very little money to do it. Uh, from the from the user's point of view, they, they come in for different reasons as well, I guess. I mean, I, we yeah. heard that in, in Europe, they're mostly uh, hobbyists and, and uh, people who just come in for fun. And, and yeah, it's more students who want to set up their own business. Is that right? Um, yes, so that's what we, uh, I mean, that's what we noticed during our, uh, our exploration. So in, in the labs, we. Uh, We've seen. Um, people cross the door for uh, sometimes with for different reasons or different uh, because they have different ideas in uh, in mind. Um, it's also linked to uh, to the way they they got aware about uh, the makerspace or about the uh, about the movement. So there is many ways to communicate uh, about it actually. But it's true, like uh, regarding, for example, the um, hobby speed perspective. So in I, mean, I speak for. Uh, in that case, for my own uh, experience, but uh, so I live in uh, in Paris, and uh, here we have some uh, maker spaces who open because people don't have enough space, they don't have garage basically to, to work on their own projects, and it's they so they, they were just looking for um, a garage and uh, tools available to work on their own project. But what is also interesting is that once they got involved in the in the in the maker space, you see that they, it goes far further <coughs> just uh, doing their own uh, uh, garage uh, garage door or table or whatever they had in mind at first. Um, but yes, this is something we didn't see um, in uh, in the four countries we uh, documented so far in uh, in Asia. So it's just to put in perspective. It's not uh, so. just a quick comment. It's just I think what. You know, I've often um, used the analogy of like health clubs. Uh, um, people walk into a health club and some people really know what they want to do. They know the equipment and they just figure it out on their own. And other people really need programs, you know, classes and other things to get involved and figure out. They need a trainer or someone to show them what to do. And I think really the future of makerspaces is more programming to, to so 
because most people, I think most people walk in not really knowing what they want to do. Um, some people really, do, really do, like a tech shop or something. There, they want to start a business. Most people are just sort of curious, and they walk in. And if you can help them engage in, in meaningful ways, and, and almost like what you were talking about with the learning community, um, when they start to make friends there, they start to be a, a center of their their, their community a bit. Okay, yes, that's another question. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, congrats for the uh, what is called the Nakers uh, movement. Uh, actually, I'm Tu here from Malaysia. Uh, just come to join your affair, you know, because actually, basically, I also like uh, to make things easy. So in Malaysia, we have uh, this story foundation, story industries where they sponsor the schools with inventions and all this stuff, including teachers. And uh, in fact, when I was looking at the map, I, I still see that you go to Singapore, how come you miss Malaysia? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a different question. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm a textbook author, uh, writing the textbooks for the secondary and upper secondary science. And uh, actually, I was uh, a bit worried, although now I'm already 60, I shouldn't be, but I'm a bit worried because in Malaysia, the uh, science students uh, in schools, uh, normally they have five classes of science and one class of so-called arts, you see, doing humanities and all this accounting and all this stuff. But the latest uh, figure shows that they already have five classes of arts and only one class of science. So it's just a reverse of the trend. The reason is very simple. Because when you ask parents, how come your kid is not studying science? They say, oh, my kids are not so bright. So what do you expect them to do? They will come out as a science teacher, if they are lucky. You know? Then how about arts? Well, though, you know who and who, you know? They are now doing the business, you know? Having a hawker store and all these things, and they are earning six figure. You know? So because of all these things, the science, so in Malaysia, we have this problem of schools trying to encourage children to go into the science stream. And because of that, actually, I'm interested in STEM, where we try to promote science. And for your makers, uh, you meant, uh, movement, as I saw that there's one 14-year-old, uh, is it? Or 16-year-old, you see? So talking about this 14-year-old or 16 year old, in fact, in business, I always say McDonald. Why? Because McDonald, they go for kids. So you find that the kids, they move around, birthday, McDonald. So as they grow up, you see, so the McDonald business is always there. So talking about your makers movement, I would like to ask whether you have any movements specifically for kids. I mean, you don't expect a community of a 16 year old mixing with a let's say 14 year old you know kids like in a lot of activities we have adults and children because the children would prefer to mix with their own group and talking about children in fact i would like uh, from an observation you see when there's a kids singing competition the whole hall is full with parents and so happens that the parents they will somehow they come out as a community because they will say, oh, my kid is taking part in this 13-year-old class or 15-year-old class and all this stuff. So I was wondering whether your maker's uh, movement, is it possible for you to promote a special section or section for kids only? And talking about in Malaysia, as I referred to five classes of arts and one class of science. In the past was five classes of science with five school lab laboratories. Now, four of them are vacant. So this fat lab issue for kids, no problem. The schools, they are more willing to give up the space for them after school hours. Thank you. So, any examples? Um, well, uh, there's a lot to, to discuss because it involves the whole education system in Malaysia. If I to listen to what you have uh, said. Uh, we, we do our parts a lot in this and, and I think Mr. Long talked about how they partner us. We have a kids' talk 
which is designed for eight years old and below. So at the Science Centre, we being a national centre, we do reach out, and I told my people we are literally an institution for cradle to grave, for lifelong learning from very young to very old. So we have the, the using a tech toy to play, and also we have tinkering studios. Uh, I encourage you to, to visit our tinkering studios. It is really meant for all ages, and, and very young people can learn to make things and, and, and create things. So we do have uh, 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 kitty things, even the uh, your quote, our quote for fun, all, all targeting very young people. Uh, and, and like in my, my first slide, I say all of us are born to be naturally at the in thing to make things happen. And, and indeed, it is possible. And uh, Singapore emphasizes a lot on human resource, so we never let any possibility slip through. So every child is encouraged to be exposed to STEM. So we have a STEM movement education from very young to very old. And in fact, we're going to launch a lot of 70 years old and below and above program uh, coming the later half, a later part of this year. Uh, and maybe uh, Mr. Lam want to say a little bit more. Yeah, certainly. I think the <coughs> trying to start young, not only in STEM, but also in some of this uh, maker culture, uh, this is something that we want to do. So other than Science Centre, uh, IMD also work with other partners to, uh, you know, either through enrich enrichment programs, etc., uh, to introduce these kinds of uh, mindset and uh, exposure to technology. Like I said earlier in my comments, you know, starting from even four to six years old. So certainly there's this desire uh, to do that, and uh, hopefully it also migrates into uh, mainstream curriculum uh, and all that. Uh, but also to address the point about uh, intergeneration. In fact, uh, I. I think that it's also very important to, to have the intergeneration. Uh, I think, uh, you know, through our sort of digital inclusion program, uh, of course, I think one of the worries about you know, all this uh, technology is that the young picks up very easily. How about the, the elderly people who are you know, in the 50s, 60s, or 70s? They are very fearful of technology. How do we ensure that they are not left out you know, as we move along? So we actually pay a lot of attention and put a lot of uh, effort to try and bring this group on board. But to bring this group on board, actually, the most, one of the most effective way is to have intergeneration interaction. So we have uh, sessions where they bring uh, the grandfather, bring the, the grandkids and the whole family get together on a Saturday or whatever, and they work on something together. And I think this not only brings more bonding, but I think it, it introduces uh, this kind of uh, intergeneration interaction. Yeah, we did see a picture of uh, intergenerational yeah. learning going on, right? Okay, I think we have a... Oh, oh, there's a map map being handed up. I'm still stuck on the semantics a little bit. I think like Andrew, I sort of um, reject the label of maker a little bit because I identify as a crafter. I've always been a craft group, a strong crafting community of DIY people, of, of artisans. Uh, a member of a craft guild, I've worked in craft supply stores, and so when I became aware of the term the, the maker movement, it seemed to me there's a bit of distrust, is this just a rebranding of something that already existed, is someone trying to sell me something or make it sound sexier, because, and that's what I really want to ask you about, is, is it a rejection of, of that, because crafting seemed a bit funny, daddy, or gendered, or for whatever reason, or is maker, is the maker movement more, is it adding more to it than, than those older traditional notions? Yeah, well, let me tell about that. You know, I hope we don't like get lost in semantics. Is the same, you know, because it's really not important what you call it, honestly. But what it does is actually create connections that can include, you know, putting a crafter next to a roboticist. You know, that's cool. You know, and we have robots that knit socks. I mean, it's really interesting to think about how this can play together. So. Um, and, and I think actually even goes back to the intergenerational thing, if we can be inclusive of even traditional forms of making and newer forms of making in, in China, in Xi'an, they had you know, an exhibit there of making uh, wooden uh, Chinese carts. You know, it was passed family to family and the family was there showing their, they had their tool bench and, and the, the wooden work there. So I think, um, you know, I hope by including crafts into a maker fair, for instance, that you know some women, you know, particularly, come for the craft, but also go look at the CNC machines and realize they can create templates and other things using new tools, and and, and then they look at the um, 
uh, soft circuitry and understand they could actually think about, you know, uh, clothing and things that have electronics in it. And so it's really almost mashing this stuff up together and creating new connections between them. I, I hope we're not disrespectful of existing communities, but I think even though, I, I'll put it this way, that's maybe a little stronger. I think even those communities need to be revitalized and reinvigorated and not just, oh, it is what it is. And I, I have, I'll give you an example. When we first started this, there was sort of also an indie crafter movement. Uh, and what was fascinating there is these were young women, largely in their 20s, who did not learn crafting from their mothers. They learned it from each other. And they came to it later in life. They didn't grow up doing it, but they decided it would be interesting. And, uh, and I think just that kind of perspective gave them, you know, sort of new energies. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we really want everybody in. And, and I think, you know, that's why I say, like, make, I hate to see when people say maker means this and not that. I say, like, well, how can you say that? Just, you know, it's, it's and. It's and, not or. Okay, thank you. I think I've seen two questions. Um, One more. Three. Okay, then it's four already. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one minute each. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm a teacher uh, in secondary school. Uh, in Singapore, um, because the curriculum is quite tight, so uh, we, we can do maker-related uh, maker activity as an enrichment after school hour. Uh, but uh, in your experience, is, uh, have you seen any place outside of Singapore that um, they practice like maker and try to integrate inside the curriculum? And if there is, or if there isn't, what can be some of the key points that uh, we, we should have? I have to quickly respond to that. In Singapore, our stand of learning program is a mainstream timetable. Uh, uh, yes, so, uh, so it is not an after school enrichment. Okay, so maybe your school is not a bad learning program. Okay. Uh, okay. so, so we have a model which is very successful, you can talk to the gentleman just two seats away from you. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, SUTD also has a big design thinking and make a movement kind of education, so that's something that you would have to explore more about. I come from SUTD, I'm not sure. And I was going to ask the question that maybe I answered myself, but it, it's uh, uh, it's really about I think the point that Vera talked about, you know, building the community in the maker movement is very important. I think it's not just building the community, but also you know having the process structured throughout. You know, if you just get people together, and if you're if you're just having a group of people doing craft work or you know any kind of design work and development work, it's I think it's the the chances chances of success is going to be a bit limited. But if you were to have some sort of like process set up, and I think that's what SUTD is trying to do with the design thinking process integrated in its education system, that could, that could help people. So, I mean, that is an education system, but you know, Maker Movement is much more beyond education system. So I wanted to hear your perspectives on you know, structuring this Maker Movement process. Thanks. Fair point, but I come uh, personally, not as intent from extreme bottom of the pyramid inclusive mindset, right? And the uh, place where I come from, right, even if you give them design thinking first, they don't know how to ask, they don't know how to speak up. So I think uh, whenever we even put such heavy frameworks, methodology, pedagogy, we have to really, and if you really want to create a local community ownership, so to say, make it real sustainable, you have to think about the minimum common denominator. And over there, my experience, and this is not a learning, but just pure experiences, first we have to make them happen, and especially the kids of this age group. And so how do we uh, get their mindset to open up? That's the process I think we need to crack. 
there's no one standard answer how to crack it, but typically creating local role models, getting local teacher to help them open up. I think those are some of the key elements which are, to me, far more immediate uh, than setting up a process around that. If you don't set that uh, the right conducive environment, then whichever framework you bring in, so to say, and of course, I mean, we, uh, we are totally with you. Design thinking is absolutely critical, especially when you're talking of innovation journey and taking them on a continuum. But there are some more mandatory things, I would say, before that, which should come in. Ideation, asking right question, those are some of the basics, I would think. Okay. Second last question. Thanks. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm from SciTech in Western Australia. We've just opened a tinkering space in our science centre, and I just wondered if the panel had any kind of top tips of how to engage people when you've only got that sort of 10-minute slot to actually get them interested in making uh, when you haven't got them for a, a series of, of sessions, or you haven't got them weekly, or how, you haven't got them for a, a specific program. Sure. Uh, so we do all learning journeys uh, through the mega space and so on. Uh, the easiest way is to get them to make something in the next 10 minutes. And usually I look at Make Magazine online. <laughs> and they, they still are sectioned by time. So <laughs> you can find the 10 minute activities. Uh, usually we get them to have, make something first, and then later they'll ask, what more can I do? Uh, so usually I don't show any slides. I try not to talk about the word making. Don't use the word maker. Don't explain that this is a maker space. Uh, and, and, and typically we just get them started on doing something first. Um, and then when they ask, then you drip feed them information, and then they'll, they'll so you can never, it's like fishing, you know, you can just fish in and drip it back, you know, you'll let the fish go a little bit, get it a bit tired out, come back again, and, and that sort of back and forth uh, helps them stay and get interested over time. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, sure. No, I, I just wanted to say, in some ways, question the 10 minute you know, model there because I, I think that has been kind of the hallmark of the science centers and what I'm seeing is that people will drop in and use the center differently and that um, uh, we're talking about intergenerational, I know from like Pit in Pittsburgh, the Children's Museum, apparently maker space there, we'll see, you know, grandmother and their child and they'll, they'll, they'll work for a while, they'll have lunch and they'll come back and work some more and I think it, it, it stops being a museum just for children, right? It's, it's something that the family is doing together. And it's really that level of engagement that, that that time seems to get lost a bit for them. So how do you introduce them to that? I, I think it's really interesting. We can start from simple projects, but having, having tools around and materials and examples of what people can do and having some element of choice, I, I think that's... When you're going to line everybody up and have them all do the same thing, that gets to be kind of rote. And um, and and I, I take an example of something like automata, you know, crank toys and things. Uh, often with a very basic mechanism. This is kind of the tinkering studio thing that you have here. People can create, you know, wonderful things on top of that. And and it, it all is sort of technically the same thing, but uh, expression from the purposes of expression can be very different. So some people will spend a lot of time on that expression, and others a little bit of time. So that it allows it to expand. Yeah, I think also, from our experience here at the Thinking Studio, these 10 minutes suddenly become half an hour or more, because people get stuck. <laughs> okay. Uh, have one last question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, It was about gender balance, it was about digital skills and engineering obviously suffer from um, uh, a struggle to achieve anywhere near a, a gender balance. And the Make a Movement, Make Affairs obviously address this and create bridges that are far more open. But I wondered if there was a problem about them becoming potentially, how you maintained uh, gender access, whether there was a reference to them becoming potentially male-dominated spaces, and whether you had to proactively work to maintain them as those sort of open spaces. So our biggest thing is sixty percent women, actually. Um, so most of the most of most of the members and uh, even the staff members are actually women. Um, so when we started, it wasn't like that. It was mostly uh, guys running the bigger space. Um, and with respect to this, is actually very simple. Uh, 
we made a deliberate effort to hire a, a, a lady to join the team. And then um, once you have one person, the rest start joining them, start joining and come again. So we made quite a deliberate effort to do it. And within two years, we managed to actually reach parity. And now actually we have more women than men in the bigger space. Yeah. So this, this is a big issue worldwide, and more so in a tech company. So we actually commissioned a study three years back. I would encourage you to Google this study called Make Hers and uh, read it. There are some wonderful recommendations which uh, are documented in that. So. Okay. Um, uh, 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 since since uh, being a host here, I want to have, uh, in a way, some kind of uh, statements because it's an inaugural, we, we, we run Maker Fair and then we let the community come together. And this year we decided to have a Maker Extravaganza with this Maker Summit followed by a Maker Conference later. So there's more dialogue engagement rather than being lost in, in doing a lot of things. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to give us feedback and so that we know whether we should grow this. Uh, like Dale said, you know, this room is not filled up. Uh, but maybe like we first started as a mini maker, but it may just grow and grow and grow. Uh, so if you have any feedback and suggestions, please share with us. Okay, we want to make things happen, make things that are meaningful and purpose driven. So I value your feedback. And uh, I want to go back to this semantic bit very quickly because uh, when we first started the Maker Fair, the media, the Chinese media asked us, how to translate your Maker Fair? Right? So we, there, were, there was a term that we used called Zi Hui Jie, that means uh, it's, it's a, a, a common uh, a, a creation of people who come and make things together. Uh, but then later we, we realized that there are different ways of calling Maker's Fair in Chinese. In, in, in China, they call it Chuang Ke Jie, and it means uh, an inventor. And Chuang Ke sounds very nice, it's like a hacker, it's a hacker. You know, Xia Ke is those, that, uh, those people who do Kung Fu sort of thing. Then you go to Taiwan, they call it Zi Zhao Zhe, DIY. So it's a DIY fair. So, so I'm just very curious because we come from different countries. I'm very happy to see, you know, we did Taiwan International, we have people from uh, far and near. Uh, so I don't know whether in, in French, for example, or in India, whether the maker has the same connotation, because semantic, it's more a culture, right? And the language labeling it is, is very interesting. Anyway, this could be a side. Thank you for your conference topic with next year's summit theme. Right? Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and giving us this encouragement that no, uh, we can make it happen. Thank you all for joining us in the first Maker Summit in Singapore. Before we break for lunch, please note that the education track for the Maker Conference will begin at 2 p.m. at Newton Room, which is located at level 2 within this building. Don't stay back for. The conference can proceed to the interim after lunch. Ashes will be on hand to direct the room. We invite all of you to join us outside this auditorium for lunch, which is kind of at the prior tornado area, and to network with the speakers and other makers. Once again, you can share your thoughts about the Maker Summit on social media with the hashtag FGMakerFair. Thank you. Yeah, um, if I may just ask the audience to remain seated while the speakers uh, go for lunch first. We have a couple of housekeeping rooms over here. Maybe we just get the speakers to follow Ling Ling and they will all be going for lunch first. Yeah. <laughs>